a brand new game, a brand new way to torture myself. But considering this is my first time playing the game and you know, considering I want to enjoy my first playthrough, I figured what better way to get acclimated to the region of Paldea than to play through it with hardcore Nuzlocke rules using only newly introduced Pokemon. Kinda. I know, very unique. I'll admit, here and now, I'll be a lot more lenient on myself as there are quite a few Pokemon I really want to use and in fun the game is still pretty limited. Losing them early on would suck and I also don't want to reset the game in the event that I do wipe out, so I'll be coming up with some BS rules midway to justify me cheating. You already know the rules of a hardcore Nuzlocke, but to summarize, if a Pokemon feigns, it's no longer usable, we'll be playing on set mode, we can't use items in battle, and we can't overlevel past the next gym leader. One rule I'll be changing is catching one Pokemon per route. If we run into a newly introduced Pokemon that we haven't caught yet, it's free game. This also includes regional forms and Pokemon that can evolve into new entries. So this is going to be slightly different to my regular videos in the sense that while I am still scripting the majority of it, I'll be going based off of the notes I made while playing the game so that you can get an idea of what my thoughts were at the time with no other information. In other words, I tricked you. That's right, that title is clickbait. You're just watching a regular playthrough with some rules thrown in the mix. Please don't go. As I said, at the time of me playing this, data on the game was still pretty limited, so aside from the gym leaders, I don't know any of the level caps or difficulty. I'll have to infer them based on other aspects like nearby traders, and as such, I'll probably be a bit off at times. But it is my first playthrough after all. I'm really not going to be too strict during this run. And with that, let's just jump straight in. Walking down the stairs, we already know that we're playing a new generation. Our parents actually have a room. Truly groundbreaking. Into the kitchen, and I'm glad Game Freak decided to stick to their long-standing tradition. And within two seconds of leaving the house, we're already introduced to our starter choices. Good Game Freak. Please always make this part quick. We have Sprigatito, Foy Coco, and Quaxley. I mean, the choice is obvious, but we first have a chance to actually walk around with our Pokemon after four years. Look at him go. We actually are loaded, like this is the richest we've ever been in the Pokemon game. Maybe a house in the Lola is comparable, but a villa on the coast of the sea is hard to beat. Look at this garden, we don't even share any walls or boundaries with any other houses. And I'm gonna say it, the graphics don't look all that bad to me. Like nothing amazing, but I've liked what I've seen so far. But enough of that, off we go. And it looks like our rival is an actual billionaire. I guess we're roleplaying as a rich boarding school prep kid. Can't relate. What's with that weird stride? I have fairly narrow eyes, so I tried to pick something that fit, but I wasn't expecting to look that smug. I love him. And there's a rival. Is this the first female non-playable character rival we've had in the history of Pokemon? Only took 9 generations. I really love him. Oh, and it looks like the Mona already starts off as a champion. I really like that approach. Like, she's probably gonna be more of a mentor that starts a brand new team alongside her own. Look, I'm not even going to pretend like they're contenders. Of course we're picking Poi Coco like everyone else. Alright, here's something controversial. I rarely nickname my Pokemon during a first playthrough. I will literally never remember Pokemon names otherwise. Rich and amazing core strength. I really can't relate. Cinnamon looks like she's going to start a new adventure alongside us. I like that we're actually getting a rival that's canonically better than us. Come on, Nimona. I really like you so far. Please pick the right starter. God damn it, Nimona. At least it makes sense in the context this time. She's trying to go easy on us. She even has her own private beach. I mean, this next part is straightforward. We start off with Ember, so we can just spam that. I really like the UI so far. I'm glad that they're going with the minimalist style. And something I just noticed. Pokemon actually have texture now. They look so much better like this. Nimona's looking to be one of the best rivals so far. She actually seems to enjoy battling, and her personality isn't entirely based on living under her brother's shadow. That's a step forward for me. Even the catching tutorials improved, with us being forced into a battle against the Lechonk with Pokeballs. We're our own catching tutorial. On the first route, we catch two more brand new Pokemon, Tarantula and Poor Me. I'll be honest, while I love Lechonk, I don't think any of these are going to be part of the main team. Not soon after, we find a weird shiny lizard that has succumbed to Mother Nature. Well, far better for me to interfere with the food chain. Why? It might eat me. What would a giant mechanical lizard eat? Guess ghosts have no calories. What a condescending expression. Why do I look like this? Thankfully, Pokemon can't read subtle insults, so Miraidon does in fact eat the sandwich and not me. A sandwich was enough of a payment for it to not let me perish here. 
But of course, it loses all of its power and we're not able to use the legendary as our starter. I don't think I could have replaced Foikoko even if we could. Back on our trail to the lighthouse, we meet Arvin, who we later learn is the son of Professor Gigachad. He has a squovet, so he doesn't really take after his father. We will promptly ignore his existence. Onwards to the route, we have a clear path laid out for us, but at this point, we have some freedom to go where we want. While heading in the complete opposite direction, we come across a hidden beach where we find a Wiglet. Now, I don't know what the base stats of Pokemon are yet, but if it's anything like Diglett, then it's gonna have the defense of a wet tissue. Probably not good for Nuzlocke. On the bed of a nearby lake, we also find Vamigo, an amazing name for such a bland design. It does have the fighting flying type though, which is a pretty rare and strong combo. But even better, I find here what I was hoping to see. Our precious baby. Paldean Wooper. He's adorable. And also comes with a poison ground type, which we haven't seen since the Nidos. And even water absorb. That's actually massive. Wooper is definitely part of the main team. Down here, we also find a first set of ruins. Hidden here, we can find a whole bunch of the Pokemon Gimme Ghoul in their roaming form. They all drop coins, and you can find them scattered throughout the region. You need 999 coins to evolve them, so spoiler, we aren't doing that this playthrough. But as a note, some of them drop more than one coin, so it's not like you need to find 999 of them. But I think I've explored all that I wanted to see here, so we should actually get on with the story. So it turns out that you need to actually talk to trainers for them to battle you. Gone are the days where once you lock eyes, you are legally obligated to fight your pets to death. I'm actually not opposed to that decision. Plus, considering how this is an open world game, I'd rather not run into level 60 trainers after I've just got my second badge. Fido is actually brilliant. Mine. Something I haven't mentioned yet is that Game Freak finally learned how to handle draw distance. Not amazingly, but no longer will people materialize two meters in front of us. We're in the first town now, and what else can we do but invade some privacy? What? Are you serious? I can't believe they've done it. After 26 years, homes actually have locks now. This is actually so jarring to me. Look, it's not like I spent too much time in people's homes in the older games, but part of the exploring experience was walking into houses and just talking to random people, hearing their weird dialogue, hoping that they might reward us with an item for our patience. Without this, this town that actually didn't look half bad now just feels empty. This isn't a game breaker to me, I honestly don't care too much, but I can see the starting a flame war online. Anyway, back on track, we have our first rival battle with Nimona. Nimona actually leads with Sprigatiso, who Flamigo can take down with a few wing attacks. Turns out it has a horrible attack lowering nature. Oh, I forgot to change that setting. Next up is Pormi, who's an electric type, so I switch that to Wupa. And Nimona terrestrializes. So we don't have access to terrestrialization yet, but essentially what it does is convert Pokemon to their terror type and gives them an extra stab. And just to elaborate, even after terrestrializing, the Pokemon still retains its previous stabs. But it turns out Thundershock is all Pormi has, which Wupa is immune to. And that's Nimona. Into Mezagoza, the capital city, and first things first, we need to switch to set mode. God damn it, Game Freak. For the first time in 26 years, they have removed the set option. Why? What was the point behind this? They've had the technology for years. It's literally just an extra option in the library and an if statement. I don't understand this company. Whatever, at least it's not like we're forced to switch out, but it's gonna be annoying to see that option. So into the city, and I actually think it looks pretty good. There are quite a few alleys and shops you can explore, and they're all just restaurants. And these restaurants are literally just menus. And like the previous towns, there aren't any houses that you can walk into. That emptiness feeling is creeping back in. Now I haven't really explored much about the food, apparently they give you boost summon to Opals from Gen 6, but I'm terrified of anything that might potentially give me the affection bonus, so I'm gonna stay away from sandwiches this playthrough. Anyway, we've explored all that we need to, and something tells me that it's not gonna get much better with future towns considering that this is the capital. Let's head to school. Who doesn't love school? On the way, we get stopped by this game's antagonist, Team Star, who seem to be a bunch of delinquents skipping school, I guess. I mean, I think that's fine. I don't think that we really need super evil teams whose machinations we need to put an end to, but only after we get the seventh badge. More often than not, they aren't very good. What I care more about is the battles that they provide, so I won't judge them too harshly yet. This was to help out Penny, a student who I'm sure bears no significance to the storyline whatsoever. During this time, we also received the Terror Orb from Mona, which allows us to terrestrialize our Pokemon. I won't be putting any limitations on new mechanics for this run. Okay, let's actually get to school, and yeah, I'm sure no one really cares about this part. We get introduced to our class, some look like they're in preschool, some look like teens, and some look like they're about to apply to their first dead-end job. Grab some lunch where we once again meet Arvin, who suggests that we look for ingredients with him. We get hacked by Cassiopeia, who recruits us to infiltrate Team Star bases to collapse them from the inside. 
one's not like the other. And finally, we head to the teacher's lounge when Monaco asks us to take the league challenge, which will be our typical get a gym badges and become the champion storyline. Now, if you're caught on, I refer to these events as separate storylines. That's because in theory, you can do these in any order that you want. Or not at all if you don't want to. I'll elaborate on the in theory part later, but for now I will give Game Freak some praise for this decision. Being able to choose where you go and the order in which you do things is such a big step forward for their feeling of exploration and making that adventure your own. I'm sure they executed this perfectly with zero flaws. Anyway, we head to the director's office where we finally meet the Giga Chad himself, through a monitor. Professor Churro pawns Maradon off on us so that we can help it regain its strength and totally give it back to him. But with that, we head to our dorms and sleep for literal months, until Nomona awakens us from our cryostasis, giving us the go-ahead to start our adventure. Ten minutes into the video. Also, what was up with that shit-eating grin? With the ability to finally ride Maraidon, and getting reminded on three separate occasions that there is a story that we need to do, we can finally head into the fields of Paldea to actually do a gym. So remember that I mentioned the fact that you can do the story in any order that you like, in theory. Well, the reason I added that last part was because while you can challenge them in any order, their levels do not scale. They went to the trouble of accounting for you defeating them out of order, and yet they do not do the easiest part of giving them different teams based on how many badges you have. Anyway, I'll probably go on a rant about that at some point, so I'll hold off for now. The main takeaway is that there is in fact a suggested order. Now I do know the gym caps, but I don't know the rest, so just know that I might mess up. In the event that we do challenge a trainer that is very clearly out of my control, we will just void that battle and not count it. For now, we can just head west to Mezagoza and traverse across the farmland to the bug gym with a level cap of 15. With all that done, I make it to the town of Cotondo, and I think we're as prepared as we need to be. Time for the first gym. So like the previous two games, it looks like we need to do some sort of trial before we can challenge the gym leader. In this case, we play real football using an American football. How does this help the harvest? Anyway, on to Casey, who's already the best gym leader. Casey leads with Nimble, and I send out Foy Coco. It outspeeds doing the little with double kick and goes down to a single incinerate. Next is Tarantula. Incinerate. Finally, Steady Ursa. This is the first time in a while that we've had a gym leader that has an ace that wasn't introduced in the region that they're in and don't have any gimmicks associated with them. Casey terrestrializes Teddy Ursa into a bug type, and of course we're going to use the gimmick ourselves. Fue Coco terrestrializes into a mega fire type. Teddy Ursa outspeeds hitting fury swipes, leaving Fue Coco below half, and a boosted incinerate doesn't get the kill. Interesting. I really shouldn't have stayed in, but Teddy Ursa decides to go for a not very effective fury cutter this time. Getting a crit, leaving Fue Coco on 3 HP. Fue Coco is able to pick up the kill with another incinerate, and that's the first badge. I don't know why I played so risky this early on. I think at this stage I'm still in my honeymoon period with this game and not really paying attention to the actual battle part. But yeah, easy enough, not like we're going to struggle regardless. Time for the next gym, and here's where the order gets kind of weird, because in terms of level cap, the next gym is actually in the opposite direction with us needing to go through the east exit of Mezagoza. If I didn't spoil myself on the gym order, I would have easily ended up at the fourth gym with an insanely underleveled team. This is one of the reasons why I feel level scaling is important if this is going to be an open world game. I wonder how many players actually naturally thought to go back in the opposite direction for the next gym. I would assume most, including myself, would have just gone through to the town to the next city. This new area introduces us to a more mountainous region, where the first Titan of Arvin storyline lies. We'll ignore it for now as I want another gym badge first. And oh god, what is this thing? Oh no, don't smile at me like that. You should not be allowed near children. And I noticed something. Game Freak actually acknowledged that some students can have facial hair. When has anyone supposedly our age in a Pokemon game had facial hair? This one has a full-blown 5 o'clock shadow. This guy is just Mario in a school uniform. Never too late to get into education. But this does bring me to another point. With the school obviously having various ages and with how limited our clothing options are, why didn't they just let us pick our age? Like they don't have to create a whole new variety of clothing since there's only four uniforms. And it's not like we need too many options. Child, teenager, and young adult would have been perfect. This could have been the perfect region to introduce this and would have made the limited clothing options so much more understandable. It's not like they really need to change anything else. Nothing else in this game really alludes to your age. It's not a big deal, but this dude's obviously like 17 or 18, and they already have a uniform model for him. Add three more and account for the customization screen at the start, and you have a new age option. Maybe one day. During this time, Fue Coco evolved into Crocola. There is not a single thought behind those eyes. I love him. Anyway, next gym. This one's a grass gym with a level cap of 18. Our task this time is to herd a bunch of sunflora, and this is where the frame rate becomes laughably bad. Luckily, finding them is really straightforward, and you only need 10, so we aren't here for that long. On to Brassius. Brassius leads with Pesalil, and I start with Crocola. Incinerate. Next is Smoliv. Incinerate. 
Finally, Pseudo Wudo, who Bressis removes its advantage from turning into a grass type, though giving us the perfect pun in the process. Incinerator still not able to get the one shot. Truly, Wudo comes out with a not very effective trailblaze, raising its speed. I don't know why I thought it'd be stuck with grass moves, as I stay in on Truly Wudo's rock throw, leaving Crocola on just 14 HP. A crit would have killed, but a final incinerate gets us the second badge. Nothing too scary yet, but I have been playing pretty risky. Though so far from what I've seen, this is probably the only way I'll lose a Pokemon, so why not have a little fun? I figure with two badges, it's about time that we get started with some other storylines. The first Titan being particularly close to us. These segments are kind of like the Totem Battles from Sun and Moon. Basically, we fight one Pokemon, the Titan, and they have two phases. The first time, we're just fighting them as normal Pokemon, and during the second phase, they gain a stab boost after eating some of the herbs that we're looking for. During the second phase, Arvin comes along to help us out. Sorta. Claw's specially weak, so with Shelter's Water Gun and Wooper's Mud Shot, it goes down in no time at all. Claw does have the ability Anger Point, which is kind of like a free Shell Smash, raising its attack and speed, but lowering its defense. Though, to be fair, it's not like it ever attacks my Wooper, and that's the first Titan. Pretty easy so far, to be honest, but I could have been overleveled for this part. I don't really know. Well, this lets Alvin grab some herbs to make a sandwich, and this seems to be the way that we'll unlock new functions from Maraidon. Also, there's some story with Arvin. I'll be honest. I don't really care. Onto our first Team Star base. Now these guys I actually don't know anything about. There's a new feature where we can send out Pokemon in the overworld to fight wild Pokemon with our own free will. It's actually pretty devastating. The Team Star base is focused in on this new feature, so I'm interested to see how they implement that. Approaching the base, we had another call from Cassiopeia outlining our mission. This feels a bit over the top considering we're just telling a bunch of delinquents to go back to school, but I'm all here for it. There's even a new character called Clive, who I really hope doesn't turn against us. Charles the Char Cadet. I love him. Anyway, before taking on the base, we had to fight the guard. Okay, hand hour isn't too bad. Level 25. That exceeds the third gym. Alright, maybe I shouldn't be here. Okay, thankfully Crocola tanks. That could have gone a lot worse. We'll come back later. Well, Mel is the one that I saw during the promotional material, so I kind of just assumed that she was the first one. Could be wrong, but I don't want to take any risks, so we'll just head to the next gym, which features electric Pokemon and a level cap of 24. Lavencia is probably my favourite city in the game. It's not that large, but I'm a big fan of the Night City vibes, and the music feels super nostalgic for some reason, like I'm playing an old Sonic stage. I really wish they didn't gut cities with places to explore. I really wish we could have seen something like a game corner or something here. Anyway, there isn't really much to do but challenge the gym. Though first we get challenged by Nimona. First up's Rockruff, and I send out the evolved form of Wupa, Clod Sire, and he is better than anything I could have expected. I really think the Pokemon designs so far have been really good, with the exception of one or two. Rockruff starts off with a Howl, raising its attack, and Clod Sire misses Mud Shot. Okay, not the best debut. Rockruff gets in another Howl, and we miss another Mud Shot. That's a 1 in 400 chance. Thankfully, none of Rockruff's bites get the flinch, and it goes down to two Mud Shots. Next is Poor Me for some reason, and we have no reason to switch. Pormi raises its special defense with charge, and Mudshot does over half. And then Pormi goes for a dig. Alright, and Flamigo, who's immune, and it can outspeed finishing Pormi off with a double kick. And finally it's Florigato, the evolved from Sprigatito. And no, become quadrupedal again. Right after I said I've been liking the designs. We can take it out with two wing attacks. You know, Flamigo has had a lot of mileage for being a single stage Pokemon that got on Route 1. Even with bad nature, it's been pretty strong. Anyway, yeah, Nimona's still not really much of a challenge. I'm hoping it's because she's still taking it easy on us. To the gym. This gym test consists of us doing a Where's Wally game, or Waldo if you're uncultured. Pretty straightforward, I did like the last one. With us fighting a fanboy in between, which I'm glad they're self-aware. Onto Iono. Iono already has four Pokemon, which seems promising. She leads with Wattrel, and I sent out Clod Sire. Clod Sire tanks this thing, taking it out with a few Poison Tails. Next is Belly Bolt, and it outspeeds using a Water Gun, which we're not only immune to, but also gain a HP from thanks to our Water Absorbability. And turns out it can do literally nothing to us. A few Mud Shots deal with it. Next up's Luxio, who goes down to two Mud Shots, and we're already on Iono's final Pokemon. She sends out Miss Magius, who terrestrializes into an electric type. No weaknesses. That's actually pretty clever. We get hit with a Confuse Ray, but Clotsar pushes past that, hitting it with Poison Tail, not doing much. Okay, this isn't gonna work out. Into Crocolor on the Hex, and oh god, that does a lot. Into Pormo, and we get hit with another Confuse Ray. Okay, I should stop switching around. I stay in on Hex, that does 75%. Arm Thrust does hit four times and barely does more than the earlier Poison Tail. You got this fight, oh. Right, I don't know what I was hoping for. Well, Pormo has Vault Absorb, so we can just switch into him, and goodbye, Pormo. We've already got our first death. Alright, Nackley's turn. 
Confused Ray, of course, and we hit a Smackdown, finally giving him Smack Yes a weak spot. Nackley unfortunately doesn't take charge beam all too well, and without newfound advantage, my shot does about the same as Smackdown. What was I actually expecting? I'm sorry, Nackley. Alright, this seems stupid, but out comes Flamigo. Miss Magius does outspeed, but we have priority in the form of Feint. Did you know that Feint had priority? I didn't. And there's the third badge. Okay, I won't sugarcoat it. Miss Magius actually rolled me. I wasn't expecting to be so poorly matched up against it. I'm sure this battle won't be too difficult for most people, but two deaths in a single vanilla battle is pretty bad for me. Back into the wild to do some more training. Now I don't really know what the levels are like for the team star bases, but considering we just fought a level 25 hound hour, I would assume they're somewhere around that. I catch a Finizen, the first ever dolphin Pokemon, and I really want to use him. I've heard that there was a secret surrounding him. Add a tad bulb so we can get our own friend shaped belly bolt. During this time, I learned just how convenient the let's go mode is for grinding. Like this is an actual large step in the right direction. You are noticeably less experienced by Pokemon, but the volume you can get through is unmatched. I mean look at this massacre. It's actually kind of sad how they're just going about their day. I mean, don't get me wrong, when I have the ability to, I'm absolutely going to use rare candies, but this is a pretty good alternative in the meantime. God, what were they thinking when they made your character model? I can smell you from here. Before entering Team Star's base, I make a final addition for the segment, and someone who I think will be part of the main team, Tinker Tough. Look at her, she is actually adorable. She's already in her second stage unfortunately, but maybe it's a Jigglypuff type situation. Probably not the best addition for a fire boss battle, but it's not like we've been making the best play so far anyway. So during the Team Star raids, it seems like you use the Let's Go feature, but with your first three Pokemon. It seems to only take into account levels and the type of Pokemon and the type of moves they have. Not really anything too deep like the base power or abilities, and they give us 10 minutes to get 30 kills which is far too generous. I'll be honest, I had no clue what was happening most of the time, but we won. There's base out Mela from hiding, and we have our first Team Star boss battle. Why do the bad guys get better character designs than us? If they have customization options, let me sign for Team Star. Mela leads with level 27 Torkoal and she's already using Sun Tactics. Flame Wheel does a lot to Clot Sire. A super effective Stomping Tantrum in comparison does about the same. We outspeed the next turn, signaling the speed tie, and another Flame Wheel brings us low. So I switch out to Crocola, who eats the Flame Wheel. I use a Sun Boosted Incinerate, which still doesn't get the kill. For the record, despite it not being very effective, this was still my strongest move at the time. We're forced to take another flame wheel before taking Torkoal down the next turn. Mela still has one more Pokemon, and it's the car that she's riding on. Where do I even start with this thing? I don't even know what its stats are, or what to assume. Its HP bar takes up the entire screen. At least I can make the educated guess that it's a fire type. It outspeeds using a screech as Crocola gets off a snarl, hoping to at least lower its attack preemptively. And that's all it does? Surely this has a boost of some kind. And it even gets speed boost. This isn't looking too good. I think we wall this thing so I stay on another screech and lower its special attack even further. I switch out to the brand new Paldean Tauros to start lowering its physical attack as Reverum finally chooses to attack using Blazing Talk. And I think we might be fine. Just to be safe, I switch out to Claw who eats, and after taking a Screech, a super effective Rock Tomb does massive damage. I have no reason to switch up my strats, so we keep trading blows until Claw gets burned. Next into Finizen, who does noticeably less damage or dive, but is able to tank Rev of Room's attacks just enough to allow a couple of dives and a couple of Aqua Jets to pick up the kill. And that's a first Team Star badge. That was actually a pretty tough battle. Like I had no clue what to expect with the Star Mobile. Plus Mela using Sun Tactics that early could have been really bad for me. We have a cutscene with the other team Star Bosses and why do they get so many different customization options? I can already tell what the story is going after they mention School Bullies. At least we get another appearance by Charlos. A friend of Charlos is a friend of mine. Except Clive. Something still seems off about him. We also meet up with Penny who's apparently the supply unit. Sure Penny. Okay, I felt really bad saying that I didn't remember her. That had a bit too close to home. Alright, I think we're ready for another Tyson. It's on the way to the next gym anyway. No, please, it's too early to do a challenge with you. The next Tyson's located up this hill while it chucks boulders down at us. Bombardier seems to be a flying dark type, so we use a few draining kisses to bring it down. Okay, that did a bit more damage than I was expecting. We might be a bit over leveled. We also get some backstory for Arvin and learn that he's locating these herbs for a sick or injured Mabustiff. Look, regardless of how well it's written, a sick or dying pet is a weakness for me. This is better to have a happy ending. But I'll still be skipping through the dialogue. I get the gist, Arvin. Miraidon now has the ability to swim. On the way back down, I grab a Bombardier of my own and find the pre-evolution of Tinker's Huff. So yeah, I guess this is where we should have come first, huh? Tinker Tink is actually so precious. Hey, let's not. 
They absolutely knew what they were doing with this thing. Why are you the creepiest thing in the game so far? I'm in the middle of something, stop smiling at me. So there's another Team Star base nearby and I figure we may as well get that out of the way. Level 19. Right, so this was the first Team Star base we were supposed to raid. I'm not saying anything. Right, so it seems that all the Team Star bosses get their own rev of room with the typing that matches their base. They seem to even have different abilities. I haven't seen a normal rev of room yet, so I'm not sure if this is a boss specific rev of room or if they have different forms. If it's the former, then this might be the first instance in Pokemon where we fight a form we can't get. It looks like this guy was the former student council president. Why is he the weakest Team Star boss? I'm sure this piece of information will never be relevant again. Okay, so with that out of the way, I think we're ready to take on the fourth gym featuring water types with a level cap of 30. This gym set in the city of Katsukarafa, which actually looks pretty cool. It reminds me of Fennec City from Pokemon Coliseum with all of its water features. But, you know, we could enter the homes there. Honestly, just made me remember how much I miss the GameCube games. Anyway, this gym test consists of us travelling across the vast desert to deliver a wallet. Yup. Okay, we'll leave that for later. Look, I'll get around to doing your challenge at some point. I just need a break, okay? So we have a little auctioning mini game that we need to get through, which I'll be honest, have no idea how it works. And we can take on Kofu, who just seems like a nice dude. Don't know what's going on with his eyebrow slash hair though. I sent out Bramblin, a grass ghost type, against Vezula, a water psychic type. So that's a pretty good start. Into belly balls. She takes an Aqua Cutter doing just below half, which triggers her ability, which basically acts like a move charge. This powers up Spark, bringing Vezula into red, and then paralyzes. We outspeed to finish the loser off with a Spark. I honestly thought it'd be a bit faster. Next up's Wugtrio. I love Wugtrio, but it'll die to a gust of wind. So I stay on the headbutt, and Belly Bolt gets flinched. With the sand damage, it's not safe to stay in, so into Flamigo. Wugtrio still outspeeds to hit headbutt, but Flamigo pushes past the flinch to hit double kick, getting a speed lowered by Gooey. Twice. But with the sand damage, we can finish Wugtrio off with a priority feint. Okay, let's be real. How many of you actually remembered Crumbobinable? I have a bad experience with it, so it's ingrained in my memory. But how many can say the same? Expecting a water move, I switch into Clotzar as Crumbobinable terrestrializes into a water type, who absorbs the Crab Hammer. I only just remember that I could still in fact use ice moves. Never punished. I would like to switch, but for some reason, my team's already taken a lot of damage. Instead, I terrestrialized Clotzar into a ground type for the boosted damage output. Man, I'm glad they went with the rainbow color palette for his ass instead of the ground color, cause you know. My boy's already got a bad nickname. He doesn't deserve to have a hat that signifies it too. Crabubbinable then uses Rock Smash, reminding me why this was a terrible idea. A Terra boosted stomping tantrum still does barely anything. We can stay in for one more. And with the sand damage, it looks like a final stomping tantrum is all we need. And then Crabominable pulls out a slam, finishing Clotzara off. I got greedy. What was I thinking? No Clotzara, I'm sorry. I can bring out Cyclozart to outspeed and finish Crabominable off with a breaking swipe. Now I have two bad experiences with this stupid crab. Clotzara's time came too soon. I'm really sorry, Clotzara. And I kinda wanted to use Bramblin too. So before heading to the next gym, some info about the Titans started coming out at this point, and I now have levels. So the thing is that I'm kind of overleveled with the third Titan. The second Titan's level was actually 19, and it's located past Cortondo, you know where the first gym's located. I'm gonna keep my mouth shut for now. Well at least the third Titan's level 28 and it's just past Leventia, the third gym. So that at least makes a bit more sense from a natural progression point of view. An Alaskan bullworm has made its home in the excavation site and it's our job to chase it down. And why is Orthworm so goddamn adorable? I don't wanna hurt this thing. It's a steel type, so Crocola can make quick work of him. Get away while you can, little buddy. Exactly, Arvin, why are you making me kill these things? Alright, alright. I guess it's worth killing a few earthworms for a good boy. Miraidon steals my sandwich and gets the ability to jump higher. Climbing would have been cool, but this is similar enough, I guess. Well, back in the desert, we can pick up an Alaskan bullworm of our own, so yes, it will be part of my team, thank you very much. Well, just up ahead we have the third team star base, but our levels are looking kind of low, especially after adding the new encounters on our team. Luckily, just up in the forest ahead, Giraffric can massacre a bunch of Passamian using the Let's Go feature. During this time, Giraffric learns Twin Beam, which is a move that allows her to evolve into Furry Giraffe. This star base also mains poison types, so we can even add Orthworm to the team. And after getting some levels into it, I think we're ready. I still have no clue what I'm doing. 
Atticus leaves with Skun Tank and for a giraffe comes out, which is the worst possible one I could have led with. Into Taurus on the Toxic, Stomping Tantrum does over half and Skun Tank has Venna Shock. We survive and another Stomping Tantrum brings Skun Tank down. Next is Mug, but Poison's starting to look kinda scary, so switching to Orthworm on the Sludge Wave. Bulldoze does nothing, and Mug goes for another Sludge Wave. Does it only have poison moves? I figure I can try flinching it with Iron Head, but Muck had Mud Slap, which Orthworm's ability absorbs. I didn't know it had that. That basically just removes an entire weakness for Steel. Muck can't touch us, it goes down to a few Iron Heads. Next up is Rev of Room in Surreal Form. So does Atticus have two of these? I know from his previous evolution that's a Steel Poison type, so I can stay in to use a four times effective Bulldoze. That does less than half. It can only use a not very effective Iron Head, so a couple more Bulldozers finish it off and Atticus sends out his bigger Rev of Room. So I'm guessing this is a pure poison type and we should be able to stay in. And it uses Flame Charge. I decided to go for a Mud Slap, which does nothing, but now we can get some cheap misses. I switch into Farid Giraffe on the Flame Charge and we dodge the Noxious Talk the next turn. And Twin Beam does a lot. Rev of Room misses another Noxious Talk and we only need one more Twin Beam. Rev of Room finally hits one. And that's it. A final Twin Beam gets us the win. That was actually really smooth. We were within the level cap as well this time. While I'm basing my level caps off of the gems, I would like to stay somewhere close to the other bosses as well. Some more backstory, and yep, this is another they aren't really the bad guys, just misguided story. At least I like how self-indulgent it is. The music they play is so dramatic. So the next gem's level cap is 36, and we're already pretty close to that, so I think we should just head over to Medelli. This gem tasks us with battling other challenges for clues, which we then use to figure out the secret menu item that we need to order. I actually really like this concept. I mean, the puzzle's easy enough, but if this was randomized, it could be fun on repeat playthroughs. I did end up buying the rice ball thinking I'd get a clue, not realizing the rice ball itself was the clue. I really hope my Pokemon don't become more friendly because of this. While fighting the trainers, our Crocola finally evolves into Skeledurge, who looks awesome. I'm really glad I picked Fake Coco. I think this is the first quadrupedal fully evolved Firestarter, unless you count Hyflosion. I do kind of miss the dopey look the other two had, but he looks cool, so I'm happy. Skeledurge also gets the signature move Torch Song, a new fire move that always raises special attack. I'm sure there will be no broken strategy surrounding this. So we can head into the restaurant and order the secret special hidden menu item, and we just f***ing massacred a restaurant full of people. The Let's Go feature has gone too far. I... I'm not that hungry. I'm sorry. The gym leader's name is Larry. That is the most fitting name for a normal gym. Norman's a pun. That's too interesting. Larry's perfect. Larry's actually perfect. He's just a dude taking a break at his favorite restaurant to avoid work. I've never related to someone in a Pokemon game before. Well, I'm sorry to disturb you on your lunch break, Larry. God damn, Larry, that battle pose. I'm intimidated. Larry leads to Komala and I send off Flamigo. Proper digestion sure is important, Larry. Double kick puts Komala into red as it goes for a yawn. I decide to stay in finishing Komala off as Flamigo gets put to sleep. The dance pass. We finally got an evolution. On one hand, I feel robbed of an ancient Chinese dragon inspired by Dance Pass. On the other hand, this is literally perfect for Dance Pass, let's be honest. I figure I can stay in for one more turn to wear off some sleep, and the Dance Pass hits a Hyper Drill doing a lot of damage. It's a Tauros, lowering its attack, who takes a Hyper Drill, which does less. Double Kick does just barely over half, and the Dance Pass paralyzes us with glare. We can stay in for another Double Kick, putting the Dance Pass down. And of course, now we learn a good fighting move. Damn it, Larry, I didn't come here to get my heart stolen. Finally, it's Staraptor. I think this is the first gym leader that actually uses a Pokemon of the same type as their gym. Which is actually scarier as now Staraptor gets boosted power for its normal moves. I switch into Skeledurge to be safe. Aw, oh, don't be like that, Larry. Larry's actually getting support. Everybody loves Larry. I'm glad Game Freak understands that Larry deserves the good life. And Larry's a people pleaser. Staraptor terrestrializes into a normal type and reads my switch going for an aerial ace. I did something a little stupid and terrestrialized Skeledurge into a fire type, removing its normal immunity. I was just in awe of Larry. Staraptor goes for an aerial ace, brings Skeledurge below half. We use a torch song, which does less than half, but increases our special attack. Look, I should have switched out. I literally had two steel types on my team, but I was just caught in the moment. I stay in as Larry teaches us some harsh lessons as he goes for a facade. That's actually brilliant. I'm loving this gym. And Skeledurge survives on 5 HP. A boosted Torch Song wins us the 5th badge. He's so happy. Best gym so far. The rest have a lot to live up to.
Without even a chance to move, we get dragged into another battle with Nimona. Considering the literal champion is watching us, having the battle on a random street seems kinda funny to me. Nimona leads with Lycan Rock, and we start with Flamigo as our lead. Lycan Rock gets the first hit with Accelerate Rock, and Double Kick just barely leaves Lycan Rock alive, even after the crit. We can move first the next turn, putting it down with the feint. Next is Pormo, so switch out to Toro, slowing its attack, but get hit with the Thunder Wave. Spark doesn't do anything, and a Stomping Tantrum one shots Pormo. Nimona's got a Gumi, which is pretty cool. Unfortunately, Gumi in its current form is pretty useless. And finally, we're on Sprigatito's final form, Miascarada. Okay, I hate that it's on two legs, but I gotta say it looks better in-game than I thought it would. Much better than this leaked picture. Miascarada is a dark type, so I stay in, as it terrestrializes. I forgot that it does that. And goes for a flower trick, which crits, taking Taurus down. I don't know how much he was in this video, but Taurus was a staple on my team. That was pretty sad. I bring out Skeledurge, who does have a weakness, which we can remove by terrestrializing ourselves. Miascarada still goes for a flower trick for some reason, which does a lot. I think it's just one of those always crits moves. And Torch Song brings it low. Well, at least we know what to expect, so we can safely stay on another flower trick, ending the battle with another Torch Song. I like how we're forced into the battle. It makes things a lot more tense. Unfortunately, Nimona's still pretty easy. Gita finally gives us some TMs, and we finally have access to Terra Blast, a move that changes type depending on your Terra type, if it has terrestrialized. Spoiler, I never use this move. Our next leg of the adventure brings us to the northern part of the map for the first time. The next Titan still needs us to have the 6th badge as it exceeds our current level cap of 42, and there are two team star bases that we can scout. I still don't know their levels, but each one that we fought so far has had a guard so we can at least gauge their levels that way. Why can I never escape you? Ever wonder what a first person Pokemon game where you play as a Pokemon would look like? It's like we're actually using Flamethrower. I have way too much time on my hands. This portion of the map is basically the snow section, and these parts are usually my favourite locations in Pokemon games. Scaling the mountain on Meridian was pretty fun, and we even got a few additions to the team. Grieved, who's just a good boy, and to Toddle, what more can I say? Tinker Tough even evolved into a Tinker Ton, and I love this evolution line. The stats were dropped, and unfortunately despite how it looks, they aren't very good. But it does get an amazing move. Gigaton Hammer, a 160 base power steel move with 100 accuracy. The only drawback being that you can't use it twice in a row. Eventually scaling the mountain brings us to the town of Montenevera, home of the 6th gym. I am never saying that name again. But before we do that, I want to scout the bases first just to know that I'm not getting ahead of myself. Hidden on the opposite side of the mountain, flowers spread across an open plain with the fairy team star base clearly in view. How do the nurse and store clerk travel here daily? They deserve more pay. Clive joins us for this operation and ponders why Cassiopeia is doing all this. Yeah, I wonder why Clive. Well, this time instead of fighting a guard, we're throwing hands with Harrington. He leads with Morgrem and I send out Tinkerton. Good start. Level 48! Oh. Oh, this could be a problem. The thing is that this is the same level as the level cap of the final gym. I mean, I guess he could be the one that we're supposed to fight last. But first we have to get through this battle. I click Gigaton Hammer and we outspeed to my god. We obliterate that poor thing. 10 levels under. Next is Hatrim, who I first hit with a brutal swing as it sets up Calm Mind, and then Gigaton Hammer all over Hatrim. That could have been so much worse. I probably shouldn't get into unnecessary battles. And that was some good info though, because I tried to find a natural way to get to the next Team Star base without Skyrim Horse glitching the mountain, and it seems like we need the climb function of Maridon to make it there, which we'll need to fight a Titan for, both of which exceed the current level cap of 42. So, onto the 6th gym. This one features ghost types, and we don't really have many Pokemon that can deal with ghosts. Our start is a ghost type, so that's a double-edged sword, and our other appropriately leveled Pokemon are kind of ill-equipped. Man, I miss rare candies. People make the argument that by not using rare candies, you're forced to use Pokemon that you'd never used before, but I swear it's the opposite. Without rare candies, I have absolutely no motivation to train up a new Pokemon, and end up using the same ones I've been using up until now. Like I am training up Bombardia, but only because I feel like I need a dark type and it's already got a decent level. Sorry, that's kinda irrelevant to the task at hand. Just kinda popped into my head while I was grinding. Alongside Bombardia, I also add Griever to the team, who evolves into Houndstone. It's also a ghost type, but it's the best option that we have. It also learns an insanely broken move, Last Respects, which powers up the more fainted Pokemon that you have. Maybe not the best for Nuzlocks, but imagine having a Choice Scarf with like 3 dead Pokemon in your party. You'd have a 200 base power move, not even accounting for Stab. No rules against carrying dead Pokemon after all. Anyway, I think we're ready all. Oh no. Why are you the one handling the gym challenge? And you call yourself MC Sledge? Don't give me more reasons to hate you. No, stop that. Why are you doing this? 
Why do you have the creepiest smile on your face while doing this? You are literally maintaining this facial expression through this entire animation loop. What even is this action? Like, what are these series of animations supposed to express? Like, you see what I mean, right? It's not just me. What does this mean? What am I supposed to feel? What are you trying to tell me, MC Sledge? Alright, so it looks like this is just gonna be a series that you're still doing that. Please just stop. You're really just gonna keep doing that in front of all of these good people, huh? Okay, whatever. Battle starts. Oh nice, we're doing double But Why during the battle? Is this where the gym battles start becoming hard? Breaking the fourth wall by distracting me. And I just realized that Skeledurge is out. Meaning if you don't get the chance to switch out Pokemon in between battles, he's gonna overlevel. God damn it, MC Sledge. Oh, we also get boosts. So it's gonna be one of these gyms. Did they learn nothing from Opal? So we do some battles. While MC Sledge does his thing. Menacingly. Oh god, I just realized his smile got even creepier. He even has his eyes open during this entire time. MC Sledge, just stop. Please. I mean, I guess I know why this is a ghost gym. True horrors lie on the stage. Oh god, we had to fight you as well. No, I'm well aware that being an MC isn't your only forte. I bet you're really good at photography as well, aren't you? People probably don't even notice you taking pictures of them. Oh, he stopped. Finally. This is all it took. Alright, this is a gym battle. Well, Skeledurge actually just barely maintained level 42. So while he will level up during the battle, we can at least still use him. Before starting the battle, I also make use of the new TM machine to tease some dark moves. And I honestly think that this is the best implementation for reusable TMs. It doesn't feel broken, and it also doesn't require too much effort either. Okay, I'm really liking her design. I mean, let's be honest, no one was gonna top Larry. But rapping Granny is definitely the next best thing. I like how the most we have to say about Rhyme's rap is yes or no. Truly relatable. Rhyme leaves with Mimikyu and Bayonet, and we unleash the birds. Mimikyu starts off with a weak slash as Flamigo brings Bayonet low with acrobatics. Bombardier breaks Mimikyu's disguise with Rock Tomb, also lowering its speed. But then Bayonet hits back with a super effective Icy Wind, lowering both of our Pokemon's speeds. And Rhyme gets an accuracy boost? I might be wrong, but is this going to be like a reverse Opal battle, where she gets boosts as the battle goes on? That could actually make for a really fun battle. I'm sorry I doubted your gem, Rhyme. This time Bayonet moves first, hitting another Icy Wind, and Mimikyu chooses the wrong target, slash bringing Bombardier low. Flamigo would have straight up died. Acrobatics brings Mimikyu low, and Thief finishes off Bayonet. Rhyme sends out Houndstone, and this time we get attack boosts. Okay, so we still get boosts. I assume it has to do with what happens in the battle. I guess it could make it more difficult if we're already having a bad time. But alternatively, if we're in a position to sweep, that sweep's just gonna come down much harder. Not sure how I feel about that. Despite the boost, we're pretty low, so I switch when we go out for Farigiraffe, expecting a ghost move, and Bombardia for Tinkerton. Instead, Farigiraffe gets hit with the play rough, and then gets doubled into by Mimikyu Slash, which also crits. That's not ideal. But we get a speed boost for some reason. I don't think we need that. Tinkerton uses a foul play on Houndstone, doing over half, and Twin Beam finishes Mimikyu off. Then Houndstone hits with a crunch, ending for a giraffe. I don't know how I didn't see that coming. We literally have our own Houndstone. I'm sorry for a giraffe. Rhyme sends out her ace, Toxtricity, and I bring out Flamigo to scout. We get an attack boost for defeating Rhyme's Pokemon, and she gets nothing for defeating mine. Even I know that's unfair. Before terrestrializing, Rhyme literally has fans crawling out of their graves to be here, and some may rightfully say that they're better than ones that were already here. Oh, what's he doing? Toxtricity terrestrializes into a ghost type, and Tinkerton moves first, staying foul play to avenge for a giraffe. Flamigo uses a ruse to gain back some HP as Toxtricity hits both mods with a discharge. Flamigo takes less damage as it's grounded, and the fans remember to give Rhyme a boost. Wait, stop that. An Omni boost? She gets an Omni boost for terrestrializing. Imagine if Houndstone was still alive. Okay. This is actually pretty awesome. I don't really want my Pokemon taking a plus one attack, so I stay in as Tinkerton moves first, using a foul play to bring Toxtricity below half. And then Toxtricity moves next, using a discharge, putting an end to Flamigo's long tenure. I bring out Houndstone, but we already know that we've won. Wait, Rhyme gets another boost? Okay, so any accuracy? I think it might be random. Tinkerton outspeeds, and a final foul play wins us the sixth badge. Okay, I wasn't expecting much, but this battle could be genuinely really tough, especially during challenge runs. One thing I forgot to check is if we get an Omni boost for terrestrializing. But regardless, Rhyme getting the boost at the wrong time could really screw you over. And I'm all here for that. 
So we're on to the next Tyson now, but I realised there was actually a way to make it to the next Team Star base by just going around the entire mountain. This seems like a bit too far, but surely there aren't two Team Star bosses that exceed the final gym. Around the mountain, I also find a whole new source of XP. These poor Go-Go travel in herds and give around 1000 XP each, at least at my level. They never saw it coming. Why is Bombardia so happy about this brutal massacre? Seriously, how do these people commute to work daily? I had to literally jump over mountains to get here. Do they get a company issued Maraidon? This area actually seems like it's supposed to be hidden away. Without going over the mountain, you can only get here using the climbing mechanics as everything of importance is on top of a cliff. The last team starbase is in this bamboo grove and this is somewhere I'll be spending a lot of time later on. But for now, I just want to scout the levels. Alright, Eri is already the best team star boss. Why do they say they're in danger as if there are actually any stakes? Also, Eri mentioned fighting Clive. Does that mean that we have to fight him at some point? Okay, Krogunk makes sense. Maybe I'm supposed to- Level 54? This team star grunt not only has a Pokemon that exceeds the final gym, but exceeds the cap by 6 levels. She's also only one level below the final Titan. Don't tell me that Team Star is actually the way that we're supposed to end the game. Right, so it's obvious that I have to come here last. Makes sense as this bamboo grove is probably the place that's the most out of the way. Krogong's easy enough, we outspeed a two-shot with Pluck, as all it does is use a nasty plot, and next is Prime Ape. Let's see what Bombardia can do. Excuse me? I wasn't expecting a grunt to have that. I didn't even bring my main team since I wanted to grind a bit. What am I supposed to do? I send out Houndstone and Primate goes for an Outrage doing over half. At least I'll play rough hits, also doing over half, and its attack dropped. That could actually make all of the difference. I stay in. And Houndstone survives on 12 HP. A second play rough finishes Primate off. That could have very easily been a wipe. This is one of the reasons why I started avoiding trainers, but I've also become careless. I had my entire team boxed for this battle. Right, I'm not coming back here for a while. Let's just head for the 4th Titan. So the next Titan is level 44, and is a ground type. If you hadn't noticed, most of my team is pretty weak to ground types, which is why I thought I'd try raising a few more Pokemon. Two in particular being a Finizen, which I caught a while back on a beach, and Frigibax, a Pokemon that I found in the cave system that was basically an alternate route to the 6th gym. I think this is going to be the pseudo legendary, and it's an ice dragon type, so it'll be pretty good against the next two Titans. Unfortunately, both of these need to be grinded up, so I headed the desert, and my god, what have I unleashed? I'm sorry, it will be cruel to let you live after witnessing such atrocities. And yeah, even after a couple of hours, my Pokemon was still pretty low leveled. I really miss rare candies. But whatever, we have Orthworm who can literally absorb ground moves despite being a steel type. So back to the snowy mountains to murder a bunch of toddlers. Unfortunately, I was pretty lazy into my training when I learned that Finizen only evolves if you're playing in multiplayer. And at the time, I uh, had an Australian copy so my friends couldn't play with me. Yeah. So, I think we can take on the 4th Titan. And we actually did run into it earlier. We ignored it before, but we should be strong enough to take down this strange looking Don Fan. And oh man, that face is adorable. I know people are going to hate it for looking stupid. I lead with Finizen and I stay in for a dive, as it takes a lot of damage from Iron Head. This could be bad. And then flinches. I don't really want my other Pokemon taking damage, so goodbye Finizen. I'm a lot less sad about this one now that I know that I can't evolve it. Into Dunsparce, it takes a lot of damage from Iron Head but survives to use a glare, paralyzing Iron Treads. Into Orthworm, who takes a weak Iron Head. Bordeaux does a bit, and Iron Treads is stuck using Knockoff. With some para luck, it eventually goes down to a few digs. The battle with Arvin goes a lot smoother with us basically using the same tactics except this time using Arvin's Mon as a meat shield. And whilst Go Villain goes down, Iron Treads has taken enough damage to guarantee us the win. We don't really learn anything new about Arvin this time around, but Maraidon does get another power up, this time the ability to glide. That's interesting, I thought it would have got the ability to climb first. Guess it's cause climbing gives it access to more locations and the glide distance is incredibly short. It honestly feels a bit pointless. Like this is a serious downgrade from Braviary and Legends Arceus. Anyway, that didn't really give us much, but now we're free to take on the 7th gym. So this gym is located near Mezagoza, but seems to be on top of a giant mountain. We still don't have the ability to climb, but the last Titan is level 55, while the gym's cap is level 45. Surely we don't need that ability to make it there, right? Well, from this Pokemon Center, I remember there being a cave entrance while riding alongside this cliff edge. This seems to lead into the next city, but for the life of me, I could not find the exit. I noticed that there was a place that we could climb to get higher, so I assumed this was just another way to get there, but we still need to climb. So instead I went the other way around, and this time my adventure took me to a small tunnel that led to a secret beach. Here there was a narrow natural incline that bridged part of the ocean that seemed to lead us towards the city, at least on the minimap. 
There were even trainers along the way, and a sign that mentioned the city, so this seemed promising, eventually leading to another cave entrance, one that I hadn't been to yet, and after looking around for a bit, it was the same one, the exact same one from last time, but I swear I never saw another exit, and I was there for a while. Okay, so now I'm a bit lost. There was another incline going up the mountain, but I figured that would be the part that we needed to climb. But I'm running out of ideas, so I might as well check it out. And yep, at the highest point, there was a dead end. Or so I thought. We now have the ability to glide. An underwhelming distance, but far enough for us to land on this little edge. And from here, we can continue upwards to hit another dead end. Right, so I might be stupid, but I think we need to fight the last Titan despite the level difference. I think it might be because technically while the Titan is a higher level, we're only fighting one Pokemon. And the second phase is even with Arvin. They've been the easiest part of this game so far, so maybe they accounted for this by giving them higher levels. So after Lake Kessaroya, here we need to fight a Dragon Titan, leveled 55, and the catch is that we need to figure out which one actually is the Titan. As a side note, I absolutely love Tetsugiri. They look so dopey. Thankfully the Titan really wants to let his identity be known, so he tells us outright. And Tetsugiri f***ing died. I like the absence of emotion. We just saw nature in action, and that's all we have to say. So the last Titan is actually Don Dozo. We lead with Tinkatan in our first play where our flowers is attack. And it goes for Body Slam that of course immediately gets the paralysis. And the next turn it uses Aqua Tail, doing a lot of damage even with the attack drop. Why even use Body Slam? This really made the level difference apparent. Based on play rough, I'm assuming this thing isn't actually a dragon type, so switching to Artabax, the evolution of Frigibax on the Water Pulse. I go for a Dragon Claw just in case, and while it does do a lot, that was thanks to a crit and not because it was super effective. Aquatel seems to be as strong as attack, and it doesn't really do much, so we can just stay in, pelting away with Dragon Claw until Don Dozo finally gets low enough to run away, meaning now we have to chase it down. After a bit of searching, we actually find that Tessigiri again running into the Herb Cave, and that only made it all that much more tastier for Don Dozo. Hey, I said something like that. Arvin, I don't know if that's a reaction I want to hear after seeing a Pokemon die. I start with a fake out, and Greedon wastes his turn using Tail Whip. I stick to a play rough, which doesn't get the attack drop, and Dondozo targets Greedon this time. Takedown does a lot more damage than I was expecting. Dondozo seems to be fixated on Greedon, so we just keep hitting attacks until Greedon finally goes down. But we're at full health, so another play rough puts an end to Dondozo. Or not. And take an Aqua Tail that would have killed if Chris. A foul play finishes it off. And yeah, of course we're fighting the Tatsugiri, that was never in question. But I was surprised to see us all healed up. Once again, fake out into a Tail Whip. Tatsugiri outspeeds with the taunt, and we do a lot with Play Rough. Greedent uses another Tail Whip. Tatsugiri hits both of us with the Muddy Water doing about half to both of us, and Play Rough brings it low. Takedown from Greedent gets the kill, and we have won the final Titan battle. That could have gone so much worse, but I think I did pretty well despite the level gap. Although a lot of that goes to Arvin for being a good meat shield. Thanks, buddy. Why is this actually getting heavy? Are they actually going to kill off another dog in Pokemon? Okay, okay, good. Expected, but I was actually kind of worried for a second. They've done it before. Anyway, Arvin's grown on me, but the reason we're here is for our final upgrade. Miraidon can now scale cliffs, and that means we can finally take on the 7th gym. Back to the trail where we had a nice vertical surface to climb, Miraidon can ram into the wall for him to latch on, and look at him go. Finally on top of the mountain, the elusive city is in clear view with the trail leading into it. Arfanada also has a cool easter egg in the form of mosaics, which means that these sprites are now canon in the game's lore. Also just past the town, we see the entrance to the cave that had us lost on two different occasions. As expected, we probably needed to climb that one section to are you f***ing serious? I passed this point so many goddamn times, and I did not see a single exit. I was here for a total of half an hour, and I never once saw a tunnel that led here. And there was even a trainer placed conveniently there to show us off its existence. Am I just that stupid, or have any of you gotten lost here as well? Please tell me I'm not just stupid. Anyway, on to the next gym. We probably need to do a gym mission, and with a lot of my Pokemon nearing the level cap because of the high leveled Pokemon that we were fighting, I figure it's best to box some of them for now and keep on hand a few new members, at least until the actual gym battle. I at least bring some Pokemon that can handle psychic types. So into the gym building. Oh no. Okay, looks like some of my team members will probably overlevel for this part. No wait, Nimona, why are you taking me outside? Wait, what? Are we actually doing this right now? What happened to the yes no question that you usually ask me? What was that? You're gonna kill me, Nimona. Nimona leads with Lycan Rock and I lead with my own rock, Cloth. Not the worst lead. Nimona, my team's boxed. You didn't give me a chance to make this a fair fight. 
We have a super effective move, so I stay in as Demona already starts with the accuracy hacks. And of course it works. She goes for another. And of course it works a second time. And this monster even tries to flinch me. But this time, not only does it not flinch, not only does my stomping tantrum hit, but it also does double damage as my previous one missed. Still not getting the kill. We were so close. Claw fest shell armor so we can safely survive the next rock slide. And even the next stomping tantrum hits, bringing Lycan rock down. Yeah, we probably could have lost two Pokemon there. Next up's Ligu, and thankfully it's still in a stage where it can't really do much. So I switch into Orthwam on the Dragon Pulse. Iron Head does just under half, but it looks like we installed Sligu out. Doesn't matter as the next one gets the flinch and we can finish it off with one more. Next up is Poor Mort, and like, is this thing fully evolved now? I genuinely can't tell. Turns out it was. Not only does it look almost identical to its pre-evo, but it also has a near identical name. What were they thinking? Look, this thing's a fighting type, but I didn't know that so I stay in. And it uses Spark. Absolute throw. We use a bulldoze, doing about a third, and also lowering its speed. Into Belly Bolt on the Thunder Wave, and it gets hit with a spark. Does this thing really not have better moves? Belly Bolt hits much shots, and we just repeat this two more times until Paul Mort goes down. And finally it's Muscarada. We're actually doing great so far, but I'm very scared of its always crit move. So as Nimona terrestrializes, we stay in to take the flower trick, putting Belly Bolt down. This is terrifying. I don't even know who can take a hit. We have low kicks who resist, but it's not exactly the bulkiest. However, I do have a plan. I sent out Dunsparce, who has a massive HP stat, and it has a special move that can paralyze. Miascarada goes for a flower trick, and yup, we're screwed into low kicks. Now lunge lowers attack, but a crit will always bypass that. I do consider terrestrializing for extra damage, but then we lose the dark resist. I stay in, and Miascarada goes for a slash. Why? We hit Lunge doing over half. Miascarada goes for another, not getting a crit and doing even less damage. And we finish this terrifying battle with a final Lunge. What happened? Flower Trick with Stab, Crit, and the Terrestrialization boost would have done more than Slash, even when resisted. I think what happens is that the AI don't account for crits, even if guaranteed. Though I swear the Terrestrialization boost would have still covered that. To be fair, I don't know what the exact numbers are as of now. Still weird either way. Anyway, works for me, onto the gym challenge. Oh yeah, I should bury you two first. I figure it's just best to keep my team on me. I don't know what to expect. Well, the gym challenge goes on fine. It's just a very slow quick time events mini game and a few trainer battles. All my Pokemon stay within the cap, but there was one trainer that had a pure power Medicham with high jump kick, which is brutal as the ability doubles its attack. Cyclozar took one for the team to lower its attack and give us a free switch. Onto the gym leader. Nimona may have been painful, but luckily our team is pretty well suited for Tulip, who uses psychic Pokemon. Tulip leads it for a giraffe, and I send out Tinker Tough. She starts with a fake out, and then outspeeds to hit Gigaton Hammer, doing well over half. And then for a giraffe, misses Zen Headbutt. After that last battle, I'll take it. We can't use the hammer back to back, so this time I hit a foul play, bringing out Espathra. Espathra outspeeds using the Shadow Ball, not doing anything, and we hit the Wind Button, bringing it into red. Another foul play, and that's the second one down. Next is Gardevoir, and like an idiot, I misclicked foul play, to my surprise outspeeding. Gardevoir's best move is Psychic, so Wind Button. And lastly is Floor Jess, who I'm happy to see is finally an ace. She deserves that. Floor just terrestrializes into a psychic type, but we outspeed, so another foul play later. One more click of the win button wins us the seventh badge. You know, after all that effort to find this town, I was kind of hoping for more. Anyway, there really isn't much more to say about this battle, and the video's long enough. Let's head to the final gym. So there really isn't much effort to get to the next gym, and we're already pretty close to the level cap. All we need to do is go to the sixth gym and head through the other exit. There isn't really much room to deviate. All you need to do is follow the trail on Glaciado Mountain and we get taken to a ski resort, which is basically just a gym next to a slope. But it's the final one, so it's special. Nimona, please stay away from me. I'm not ready. Okay, good. Thank you. Dude, why do you follow me everywhere? For this gym challenge, we just have to go down a slope. Yup, that's it. We don't even go down the cooler slope. I'm not sure how you fail this. There aren't even any trainers. Anyway, this lets us meet the man that revealed the sheer number of sexually insecure Pokemon fans. Which surprised me, considering the existence of some certain Pokemon and people's very open feelings about them. Anyway, let's take on the final gym. Grusha leads with Frostmoth and I send out Skeledurge. I think we got this. Frostmoth sets up a Tailwind and goes down to a single Torch Song. I'll be honest, I have the memory of a goldfish. 
Skeledurge gets hit with an earthquake, but a booster torch song one shots Bearsick. Next is the Titan, and I better switch out. So it's a Tinkerton on liquidation. The Tailwind still seems to be up as we get hit with another liquidation, but we click the win button, and now comes Altaria. Interesting choice for the ace of the final gym. Into Clawf as Altaria terrestrializes, and we get hit with a hurricane, and then get confused. I figure I can stay in as Clawf takes a nice beam, leaving it on 7 HP. It's still confused, but it pushes past that, hitting Rock Slide. Not even doing half. Into Orthwam on the Dragon Pulse, and while we should wall its attacks, our special defense is pretty bad. Hurricane puts us right into kill range, and Iron Head is still not enough. Now I love this little worm, but all of my Pokemon seem to be in the two-head kill range. I don't think we can switch. I pray for Hurricane to miss, which it doesn't. Goodbye, Alaskan Bullworm. Into Tinkerton, and Wind Button. And we have gotten every single badge in Paldea. How long into the video? We aren't even done yet, there's still two Team Star bases, and all of the endgame stuff. But here's the catch. From here on out, I'm going in completely blind. At the time of me playing this, there was like no info beyond the gym leaders, at least without delving into some really spoilery stuff. And even then, there's nothing about the levels or anything. So from here on out, we just won't be playing with a level cap. I'll try to infer them based on trainers and just general intuition, but I won't be too strict about exceeding them or anything, since everything will be pure guesswork. So my next level caps I'll be setting as 51 and then 57. Two levels above the grunts that we fought outside of the base, I think that's a pretty safe assumption. And with our levels already nearing their first cap, why stall? We lost Orthworm at the worst time, but Team Star grunts are pretty much rolled by Tinkerton, and we're already on Boss Ortega. Oh okay, my levels weren't anywhere near the cap. Oh well, we got this. Ortega leads with Azumarill, and we send out Tinkerton. Underleveled and a bad matchup, seems about right. Fake out into Gigaton Hammer brings Azumarill below half, and we dodge the first Aqua Tail. Next I go for a play rough, which puts it into red, as Azumarill charms us, lowering our attack. I decide to switch out to Artifax, which seems risky, but Azumarill goes for an Aqua Tail, which crits. Back into Tinkerton with the drops removed, and Azumarill hits play rough. The fake out crits, bringing Azumarill down. Next is Wigglytuff, so win button. Next is Dash Bun, and my god, why do I not have one? We take a play rough, then have to do one of our own. But after taking one more, which of course crits, win button. And finally we're on Rev of Room, who sets up a misty terrain. Unfortunately my best Pokemon for this thing has already taken a lot of damage, so we have to switch out. Into Skeletor, Dirge, who takes a Steel Roller, doing extra damage because the terrain was up. That's actually a pretty cool strat. Rev of Room uses a Confused Ray, and I go for my own status with Will-O-Wisp. And it fails? The terrain's gone. Can these things not be statist? Well, we wasted a turn, but we wall, so we begin the Torch Song spam. And yep, that's all there is to it. Fourth Team Star boss down. That was actually pretty painless. I was kind of worried that I have a coverage move to hit Steel and Fire types, but it didn't, so we could sweep. A ground move would have really hurt. We get some more story on Team Star. Turns out that they were actually the victims of bullying, and then got ostracized for standing up for themselves, and yeah, like, did anyone not see that coming after the first flashback? Anyway, we only have one Team Star member left, but with how high the grunts levels were, part of me wonders if we actually have to do this part later. So, this might sound stupid, but I think we should scout the Elite Four first. Considering the level of the final gym, and that we're free to challenge the Elite Four now, maybe this is just the natural progression. I mean, they did kind of change up the formula in Sword and Shield, with multiple story events happening while we were fighting their equivalent of the Elite Four, so back to school. I actually have no clue where to go. Clavel wants me to teach him some hip lingo. I don't know, it could be part of the gym exam. Is this a dating sim? This is a dating sim. Okay, this scares me. The marker is in this general direction, so we'll just fly there. Oh, that was easy. What, is Geetha fighting me right here? Right, that makes more sense. I don't know, that looked like the intro to a battle. We get grilled on some final stuff, and why does this feel like an actual exam? This actually feels intense. The moment pause before Rika smiles is flooding me with repressed memories. I've already done a job interview, I don't want to do another one. Is there even a lose condition? Okay, I don't want to fail this, so I'm not brave enough, but I want to see what happens if I say no. The hardest question they asked me was what the name of the school was. Who's failing this exam? Actually, to be fair, I had to look that up. Alright, we're already being forced into the league. Guess no choice but to fight. Right, so first impression, the room's kinda boring. Like after the massive stadiums and shield, this feels like a step down. Maybe it gets more interesting as we go on? Rika's cool. I guess it makes sense that our examiner is also an Elite Four member. Alright, Rika, what do you have for me? Right, a whiz cash. I actually can't tell the type specialty. I guess ground since we already have a water. Level 57! Right, that's not happening. 
What? Why can't I leave? Guess there's only one way out. For the record, I'm not counting this. Well, I was hoping for something in between, but looks like we're doing the final team star base. I was trying to avoid it, but after the level cap is 57 and my highest is leveled 50, so we have to grind. Woo. Man, I miss red candies. Back to the bamboo forest, and before we start grinding, I pick up my final encounter, Pawneard. I love the Pawneard line, it is one of my favourites of Gen 5, and Gen 5 has a lot of designs I love, and Bisharp has a new evolution, so we have to use it. But the issue is, at this stage, I have no clue how to evolve it. I know it's something to do with killing other Bisharps, but I don't know the specifics. Bisharp isn't really going to be useful in the next battle, we're pretty much going to use her as a pivot, if anything. Anyway, let's get this grind out of the way. I spent about 2 hours just spamming the let's go feature until I got bored, and that brought my team around level 53, give or take. The closest one to the level cap was actually Bisharp. I also added Fido, the fairy, who evolved into Dash Bun, and Veluza, a water psychic type, along with another fairy and two ghosts. I think we're set. What could go wrong? This was actually one of the more difficult Team Star raids. They had much stronger Pokemon, and aside from Tinkerton, my Pokemon weren't too prepared for the matchups considering their secondary types. But they give us 10 minutes, and there's like no lose condition, so on to Eri. Eri leads with Toxicroak, and I send out Houndstone. We immediately get hit with a Sucker Punch doing less than half, and Houndstone digs into the ground. Toxicroak misses Sucker Punch, and Dig does just less than half. I figure I can stay in for another Sucker Punch, and this time Dig high rolls, getting the two shot. Next is Lucario, and while I'm expecting a dark move, it could also use Bullet Punch. Luckily, we have the perfect pivot, since we know it won't be using a fighting move. Bishop gets hit with Dark Pulse. Knowing a fighting move's coming, we can get a free switch into Skeletor Dirge. See, Bishop's already proving invaluable. We tank a Dark Pulse, but we can't really afford to be flinched. Skeletor Dirge has a yet to disappoint, as he hits a Torch Song, getting the one shot and raising his special attack. Unfortunately, Passamian's next, and we can't outspeed a Passamian. So, we had to forfeit our boost as I switch back into my pivot on the Rock Tomb. Now I can bring out Veluza on the close combat, which also lowers Passamian's defenses. We can now outspeed to... You look fast. You are literally chasing me down in the lake. Into Tingatun, who outspeeds. How? Play rough puts it low, and close combat does over half. One more play rough, and that's that. The loser's a disappointment. Annihilate, though. That's the evolution that Primeape deserves. That is a perfect evolution to a classic Pokemon. Well, look, I don't want to lose Tingatun yet, and we've already got a ghost type, so sorry, Houndstone. Oh, Eri's the best Team Star boss. Yeah, that tracks. Your turn, Dash Button. Annihilate still goes for a close combat, so its ghost move is probably weaker, and I just lower its attack by two stages with charm. Another close combat, and even with half defenses, a play rough still doesn't kill. We should be fine. And then Annihilate uses Rage Fist that almost kills. Why didn't it use this earlier? Bite picks up the kill. And we're on the final rev of room. Now a fighting type shouldn't be too hard to deal with, but the problem is that most of my Pokemon are in really rough shape. And I don't really want to risk a switch in, so sorry, Dash Bun. She can't outspeed and goes down to a spin out, which sharply lowers Rev of Room speed. Skeletor should wall since it's immune to fighting and it resists steel. He even outspeeds hitting Torch Song, doing a decent amount. And this thing raises its defense with stamina. And then hits us with high horsepower, which Skeletor survives on 5 HP. That was an emotional roller coaster. Listen, I'm not really sure what I can do from here. We outspeed, but we aren't getting it in the next hit. And then we're gonna raise this defense, which will make it harder for the subsequent Pokemon. I figure the best move is to stay in to use another Torch Song, which does do a lot, and Rev of Room uses a high horsepower, which misses. I genuinely think that this is one of my luckiest moments. That's a 5% chance, which isn't crazy, but it could not have come at a more perfect time. Skeledurge outspeeds, and the final Torch Song gets us the win against the final Team Star boss. I honestly don't know what I would have done if that didn't happen. I could have prepared a lot better, but we had the right Pokemon considering we're doing this blind, and yet that was probably still the hardest fight I've had so far. More backstory on Team Star, and Cassiopeia reveals that they were the big boss of Team Star all this time. Was anyone surprised? I'm glad they don't linger on it too long as if it was a big reveal. Now, all we need to do is meet them after dark and hope that we get to keep at least one of our two kidneys. Clive still seems a bit off to me though. 
So we're nearing the endgame now. All the storylines have come to their climax, and all that's left is doing the final battles for each one. And aside from Rika's first Pokemon, we don't really have much to go on when guessing levels. Now, I'm assuming that the Elite Four and the Champion would be the hardest parts, right? Like, there's no way that Arvin's gonna be stronger than top champion Geetha. And considering how he's the least battle-focused out of the three stories, I'll fight him first. I decided to set my level cap at 60 for this next segment, and I'll just let my Pokemon naturally level up from there, while keeping the champion level cap at 65. I'm basically just using Leon's team as a guide. But before going back to our humble beginnings, we have a team to rebuild. I add back Gardevax, who I boxed for the time being, and put Clawf into Toddle in the party. But there are actually two other Pokemon that I want to catch before I start training. So we head back to Lake Casaroya and hunt down the giant catfish, Dondozo. And we also catch the secret commander, Tatsugiri the Sushi, both of whom I can use now. I think it's time that we also turn Bishop into a useful member of the team, and introduce you to my favourite quality of life changes. One of Bishop's signature moves, the one it will always have on competitive teams, is Sucker Punch. This move allows us to have priority if the opponent is about to attack. It's a very useful move for Bishop as it's lacking in speed, and I'm sure it'll be a very useful move for its evolution. But one small issue with Sucker Punch, it's an egg move, which is basically a move that Bishop can't naturally learn and has to be passed down through breeding which is something that's generally frowned upon in Nuzlocke's. But this game has added something that could honestly make so many more Pokemon a whole lot more viable now. There's a new item that was introduced called the Mirror Herb. You can buy it at the Deli Bird Present store after you collect a certain number of badges. The in-battle effect that this has is that it allows you to copy the other Pokemon stat changes, but that's not what's important to us. We give Bishop the Mirror Herb while she has an empty move slot, and add our old friend Lowkix to the party, who has recently learned the move Sucker Punch. Now we can go on a lovely little picnic and make ourselves a sandwich and Bishop now has Sucker Punch. No breeding required. This game has opened up a way for Pokemon to get any of their egg moves at any time, regardless of what the gender or egg group is of the other Pokemon, with a one-time fee of 30k, which is honestly easy to get at this point in the game. This is a game changer and makes so many Pokemon more viable now. I don't think it's about time that we evolve Bishop. So it turns out there's this new item called the Leader's Crest, which you can find on Wild Bishop. I don't know if we need one ourselves, but I gave one to Bishop just in case. What we need to do is defeat three other Bishop holding one, and then level up. And we don't have to just go around killing random Bishop hoping that we get lucky as there's an obvious tell. Bishop holding the Leader's Crest are surrounded by their lackey Pawniard. All we have to do is embarrass it in front of all of them, throw a red candy on Bishop, and she becomes King Gambit. Perfection. I am absolutely loving the Pokemon designs of this generation, especially the evolutions of older Pokemon. I still don't have the stats, but this thing looks like a monster. I was content with all of our Pokemon, but then I found out that the special ability that Tatsugiri has, which allows it to take control of Dondozo, only works in double battles. Disappointing, but I still do want to use Tatsugiri. I box Dondozo since we don't really need two water types. Instead, I add Smolov to the team as we kinda need a water counter. I avoided adding her before because I didn't like her terror type, normal, but I've learned that it doesn't really matter too much. And finally, I spend the next 3 hours training all of my Pokemon to roughly level 60, the old fashioned way. During this time, Artifax evolved into Baxcalibur, and the Smolov evolved into Dolov, and then Abolova. I killed so many go -Goat. But those go -Goat died for a good cause as now we can put Arvin's story to an end, once and for all. What a nice father, asking his only child to go to an incredibly dangerous place where he almost lost his life. The dude's clearly traumatized. But that's pretty cool, looks like there's more to the game than I thought there was. Maybe this is the true endgame, like End's Castle from Black and White. But that's for later. For now, we have our final battle of the Tyson quest. Arvin leads with Greedent, and I sound back Excalibur. Alright, 58, I think we're pretty accurate with levels. I start off with a nice cool crash and we get to turn 1 flinch. That did less than half, so don't take any risks and use a Glaive Rush, Baxcalibur's signature move, which is kind of like a Dragon Close Combat, except we only take more damage on the next turn. Next is Garganackle, the final stage of Nackley. It actually looks really cool. What? Level 62. Arvin. What the f- <laughs> This isn't even his ace. Well, I need to switch so into Tinkerton. Yup, just the right level. I press the win button, and it doesn't even bring it into red. Garganackle sets up Stealth Rocks, but what we can do is use Encore, locking him into that move. Encore is one of the most broken moves in Nuzlocke's, and I highly recommend people learn how to use it, as this could essentially give you three free turns. And now it's a TM, so it's become a whole lot more widespread. One more click of the win button. Next is Govillain, so I switch into Tatsugiri. God, look at him. On the Fire Blast, which it eats. Dragon Pulse does over half, and Crunch actually brings us really low. One more Dragon Pulse puts Govillain down. Toad scrolls up, so I switch back into Baxcalibur, kind of forgetting about the rocks. But we only get hit with a power whip. 
It's a grass ground type with a weak defense, so now shot gets the one shot. Cloisters out, and I figure it can't really do much to us, so staying for a crunch, doing nothing as Cloister sets up a light screen. Another crunch, and Cloister uses liquidation. Interesting. Well, we got this. Glaive rush. And Cloister survives. It uses liquidation, which will now do double damage. And we survive. Why do I insist on making these stupid plays? One last crunch. And Arvin, Mabustov just cheated death and you're already trying to get him killed. Level 63. Mabustov intimidates Baxcalibur and we need to switch. But I just realized that he's about to terrestrialize and I don't really know what I can switch into. Tinkerton's the safest option, but I don't really know what sort of coverage Mabustov has. I haven't used one. As expected, it terrestrializes into a dark type, meaning it's about to nuke us with dark moves, for which we only have one resist. Thankfully this time, it goes for an even weaker play rough. Now, we have the perfect move for the situation, but the thing is that I don't know if I outspeed, so I might look like an idiot. I stay in, and I'm an idiot. Mobostov outspeeds hit Firefang, which Tinkerton survives. We lock him into that with Encore. Okay, actually not the worst situation. I switch into Skeledurge on the Firefang, and now we have two free turns. The first turn, I use Woolwisp to burn Mobostov and halve his attack. And then I realized that I can terrestrialize myself to get rid of the dark weakness. As you can tell, I really haven't been using terrestrialization all that much. This also powers up Torch Song, which in turn also raises our special attack. With the burn and our loss of Ghost, we're surviving a crunch, and despite the defense drop, we can end this battle with a final Torch Song. This actually was intense towards the end. I was just kind of making up things as it went along. But that could have gone a lot worse. My boss have outleveled all of my mons by a significant amount, and it hits hard as well. Despite me skimming over him, Arvin's actually really grown on me, and I really like that battle. I think it's cool how he uses all of the Pokemon that he had during our Titan battles. Alright, that's pretty much confirmation that becoming the champion isn't the end, and that we have more story as the end game. But I wonder who he could be talking about. I feel like that's a spoiler. Well, at least they aren't treating us like we're stupid. And that's something that Game Freak's usually very fond of. Battling Arvin took us into the night, so onto the next phase. Please don't kill me, Penny. Clive's joining us for emotional support, and I've connected the dots. Why he seems so suspicious to me this entire time. He's wearing shorts and a zip-up blazer. What were you thinking, Clive? Wait, why are we fighting Clavel? Clavel leads with Orangaroo, and I start off at Baxcalibur. Oh no, level 60. Don't tell me he's stronger than Arvin. We start with the crunch doing half and get hit with the foul play. Another crunch gets the two shot. Next is a bomber snow, so I switch out to Skeledurge as it sets up an Aurora Veil. This prevents Torch Song from killing, but we get a boost. Blizzard does nothing at all. But then freezes. I can't switch out on an incoming Blizzard, so I stay in. And Skeledurge gets the turn one thaw out. Torch Song melts a bomber snow. Next is Poltegeist, and I could have stayed in, but I bring out King Gambit on the Shadow Ball. I don't think Poltegeist has anything, so we stay in, but get burned by Will-O-Wisp. Kowtow Cleave does barely a third. This activates weak armor, and I just remember that the veil was still up. But with that down and the defense drop, we can outspeed hit Sucker Punch, finishing Poltegeist off. Next up's Houndoom, so I switch into Tatsugiri on the Fire Blast, which it eats. Tatsugiri can survive a Dark Pulse, so I stay in and hit Muddy Water, getting the one shot. Oh no. Don't say it. I switch into Baxcalibur on the Giga Drain and then get the one shot with Icicle Crash. And finally we're on Quexley's final stage, Quaquavel. And my god, why is he fabulous? I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't that. The issue is that now I have no clue who to switch into. I'm not sure who's actually capable of taking one of his attacks and then being able to survive another. A Bolivar, my only water counter, also has the normal type, which is a weak to fighting. I switched out to Tatsugiri, and yeah, he wasn't surviving a brick break. Man, I really wanted to use Tatsugiri. And it also started raining. I bring out Tinkerton and lock Quaquavel in, which allows me to safely bring out Skeledurge to burn it with Will-O-Wisp. With the Encore ended and the water move imminent, I bring out a Bolivar who eats Quaquavel's signature move, Aqua Step, which also raises its speed. And then our Bolivar's ability triggers, setting up a grassy terrain. With Quaquave all burned, we survive the brick break and a terrain boosted energy ball gets the one shot. That was actually a really well rounded team. Losing Tatagiri sucks though, and I've never really had a chance to use him. But I guess I can bring the other water type. Uh, right, Penny. Okay, there's another battle. I'm actually really glad that she isn't just a standard meat character. Oh, Clive's back. Alright, Penny's great. Penny needs Lumbreon, and I stick with Old Reliable. 
Umbreon gets priority on Baby Doll Eyes, lowering our attack, and Icicle Crash does barely 25%. I switch out to our Bulva on the Dark Pulse, activating Grassy Terrain. Umbreon tries lowering our attack, but we use the special Dazzling Gleam, still barely doing anything. And I've given Umbreon some free recovery as well. I figure I should just go for some passive damage with Leech Seed and start pelting away with Terrain Pulse. With Umbreon low, I switch out to King Gambit on Foul Play, and Leech Seed finishes Umbreon off. Next is Flareon. Are we actually gonna get an Evolution team? I switch out to Dondozo on the Flare Blitz, and it gets burned. Of course. Then we get our attack lowered, and Aquatail does nothing. But this gave me an idea. I switch into Tinkerton on Baby Doll Eyes, and switch right into Backscalibur on Flare Blitz, doing a lot. But Backscalibur has a special new ability that raises its attack when it's hit with a fire move. And now that Flareon's baited into using an attacking move, we can outspeed to finish it off with Crunch. Next is Leafeon, and we can- oh god, I thought it was slower. And we survive, and get the one shot with our school crash. Hey, did you know? Vaporeon dies to a single Glaive Rush. And since Jolteon will outspeed, I switch into our Bolivar getting hit by a Thunder, then setting up Grassy Terrain again. We survive another Thunder, which paralyzes us, and then we can't move. Jolteon hits another Thunder, but this time our Bolivar can move to hit a boosted Terrain Pulse. Not getting the kill. Wasn't even close. Jolteon hits the fourth Thunder in a row, a 25% chance, but we can move past it and our Bolivar finally gets the KO. And finally Warren Sylveon. I switch into my own fairy as Sylveon terrestrializes into a fairy type. My VV power. Even with the boost, Moonblast does nothing. Sylveon lowers our attack, allowing it to survive the wind button, and I can just lock it in with Encore. With no ability to attack, a final click of the wind button wins us the battle and brings an end to the Starfall Street storyline. These last few battles have been pretty good considering how easy the early to mid game was. We get some final backstory on Team Star and why Penny wanted to disband the team and why she sent us to do it. And we get a cute little cutscene with the bosses meeting Big Boss, with Penny learning that the real gang war was the friends that we made along the way. All in all, even with how over the top dramatic and kinda cliche it was, I actually really like the storyline. Not every villain story needs to be world threatening, and I like that it was more personal, kinda like in Sun and Moon. Arvin's story was slightly weaker, but his character grew on me, and again, I'm just glad it didn't take up more time than necessary, which some games like to do, like Sun and Moon. All that's left for us is the Elite Four. Hopefully the game manages to end strong. We've gotten some insight on the levels of the Elite Four, but considering we have a champion battle included, I'm willing to bet that Geetha's levels are going to be higher than Arvin's and Penny's. I mean, she's the champion. Their levels were 63, so I think that's a good level for us to train to. But there's one thing I want to do before training. Look, we're like at the end now. I don't really want to waste time raising a new Pokemon when there's still one that I barely got to use. So, this is incredibly rule breaking, but you've already watched far enough knowing that this title was clickbait. I sacrificed 10 Pokemon to bring Tetsugiri back to life. Look, these Pokemon can have the spotlight during a different playthrough. It wouldn't feel right raising them all the way to level 60 just for the league. Not really understanding how they perform using them throughout the game, and just getting to use them at their strongest. Is this cheating? Yes. Back to the bamboo forest to get those final few levels on all of my Pokemon. Oh. Oh. I even sacrificed a shiny in the name of the great Tetsugiri. I then use up all of my remaining rare candies, leveling everyone up to level 63, with Tinkerton getting an extra 1 to 64, and Skeledurge getting 2, bringing it to level 65. After teaching some TM Star Pokemon, we can make the treacherous trek to the Pokemon League for the very first time. Oh, we're here. So this time I know for a fact that we outlevel Rika, but I'm hoping that the League starts scaling up as we go along. Rika leads with Whiskash, and I send out our Bolivar. Yup, this is my first time fighting Eureka, I'm glad you remembered. We don't outspeed Whiskash. We get hit with Blizzard, which activates Grassy Terrain and Energy Ball gets the one shot. Next is Camera Up, so I switch into Tatsugiri on the Yawn. I figure I can be put to sleep, so I stay in, getting the one shot with Surf. Don fans next, so back into our Bolivar, who dodges the Stone Edge. And after tanking a Poison Jab and getting poisoned, Don fan goes down to an Energy Ball. Oh. Into Tinkerton, who's immune, and Foul Play picks up the kill. Onto Dug Trio, and yeah, I don't know what this thing's gonna do. Win button. Oh no. Why are you doing this to me? Finally, it's Clodsire. I switch into Backscalibur as Clodsire terrestrializes into a ground type while it protects. I'm sorry, buddy. And that's Rika. Yeah, okay, I'm overleveled, but I don't think that team really could have done much. I might have lost a Bolivar at most. Yeah, what I said. The next one in the league is Poppy. Wait, are we really staying in the same room? 
Oh, that's kind of disappointing. I mean, we had something similar with Sword and Shield, but at least that was a massive stadium. This is just kind of bland. Well, whatever. Something cool is that we can actually still access our boxes, so that's good info to know for a certain other challenge I might do. Is Poppy the first child that we've had on the Elite Four? I mean, we had Ace Arola, but I don't think she was a child. But I'm basing that on her looking older than our character and her being a trial captain. And we were like 11, so maybe she was. Poppy leads with Copper Raja and I send her back Scalibur. Okay, not the best matchup. Into Skeledurge on Heavy Slam. Skeledurge outspeeds getting the one shot with Torch Song. Skeledurge picks up another kill. One more. Magnazone survives and sets up a light screen halving our attack. Goodbye Magnazone. Oh look, we have one of those as well. Look, our attack is halved, but we also have four boosts. Sorry, Tinkerton. And that's Poppy. We literally got through a whole team with a single fire-type attack. I mean, it's a good fire-type attack, but I thought we were past this. Leave that back in Kanto and Johto. Yup, this is the room where we're doing all of our battles. Larry! Okay. Sorry. I don't know what I was complaining about. Finally good to see something interesting happen in this Elite Four. Everyone knows you, Larry. No, Larry, you're literally the best thing about the Elite Four so far. I mean, I am sad that normal types missed another chance to be on the Elite Four, but I'm sure Larry's not going to disappoint. Larry leads Atropius, and I send out back Scalibur. Flying is actually the second perfect type for Larry. You're already a better Lance. Okay, I mean, Larry, look, I like Tropius as much as the next guy, but it's not very good. Aw, and you even kept your buddy. I mean, I don't know why this can also be your ace, but I'm glad it's on the team. Backscalibur got hit with Intimidate lowering his attack, and this thing has close combat, so into Scalidurge. Brave Bird does less than half, and Torch Song just misses the kill. I know a close combat isn't coming, so into King Gambit on the Brave Bird. The recoil damage finishes Staraptor off. Next is Altaria, so switch back into Backscalibur, who gets hit with a flamethrower, also raising its attack. That works out perfectly. A 4 times effective Ice Shard gets us the one shot. We're now faced with Orocorio, who's now been on both of the only two Flying Elite 4 members. This time in his pom pom form. I mean, it's cool, but what's it gonna do? And finally, it's. Oh no. Why is the Elite Four trying to remind me of my mistakes? I mean, that's very fitting for Larry. I might have forgotten that Flamigo was also a fighting type, but Backscalibur outspeeds and gets the one shot with Icicle Crash, so technically I played well. And that's Larry, the final Elite Four member. Alright. Don't talk to Larry that way. I have never met you in my entire life. Why are you acting as if you're my teacher? First up's Noivern, Ice Shard. Next is Flapple. Ice Shard, Dragalge, Icicle Crash, oh a Haxorus, finally something cool, why is it so small, into Tinkertown who's immune to Dragon Claw, Encore Haxorus locking it in, and Wind Busted into play rough, you deserved a real sentence Haxorus, wow are they really using my team against me, Baxcalibur, Wind Button, oh right it's pure dragon now, play rough, that's it, oh, that's it. I mean, that was certainly an Elite Four. Why are they still so low leveled? I thought Hassel's levels would be closer to Arvin and Penny. Maybe since this is like an exam, the actual champion battle is Laser and we fight Nimona who will have similar levels. I mean, you are supposed to technically be able to do this in whatever order without needing to do the other storylines. And it's raining. That actually might make it harder for me. Oh, looks like we really are fighting Gita already. This really doesn't feel earned. I feel like considering that she's the top champion, we should be fighting her later when we can become top champion. Okay, at least she's got some fighting words. Gita leads with Espathra, and I stays back Scalibur. Oh, come on, don't say that. What? Level 61. Her first Pokemon's level was 61. That's weaker than Penny's lead. Okay, maybe it just scales differently. Espathra starts off with a Dazzling Gleam, doing less than half, and Backscalibur hits back with a nice cool crash, leaving Espathra in the red. I thought this thing was a flying type. Ice Shard finishes it off. We're already on King Gambus, and they really are just using my team. Supreme Overlord boosts its attack, but it's only one one that's fainted, so it shouldn't be too bad. I switch into my own King Gambit on the Iron Head, and despite the level gap, Gita outspeeds hit Cowtail Cleave, not doing much. A single low sweep proves the better King Gambit. Alright, I kinda liked how condescending that was. Avalug. Why does a champion have Avalug? What the actual f is this thing gonna do? Okay, that was pretty funny. Into Skeledurge and Torch Song finishes it off. 
She's got a Veluza, which is interesting, but I already know it's bad. So into our Bolivar on the liquidation. And after taking a nice fang, Energy Ball takes care of that. Go Goat! Keitha, you're a champion! Come on. You can do better. I switch into Skeledurge on the play rough. Go Goat uses a bulk up and takes the Torch Song surprisingly well. Zen Headbutt doesn't do much, even with the boost, but it still survives another Torch Song. Another Zen Headbutt, and we get flinched. Alright, we can take one more. And a final Torch Song finishes Go Goat off. Okay, I was talking it down, but it was fairly tanky. Not that it could do anything in return, and is completely walled by Steel types. But come on, I'm trying to say something positive. No, I don't think you're allowed to say that anymore. Wait, we're already on the final Pokemon. I don't know what that is, but it looks pretty cool actually. Oh no, Keitha. Level 62. Level 62. Really, Geetha? You're weaker than Arvin, Geetha. This isn't the way it was supposed to be. I'm so overleveled. Well, I don't know what this is, but we need to switch out. And we have a Mon that we've revived, but hasn't really been put in the spotlight yet. Into Tatsugiri and Glamora terrestrializes into a rock type. Come on, Geetha. So I don't know if you've noticed, but so far the Elite Four have been the same types as the Titans. So I was kind of expecting this, but really hoping against it. Rock is arguably one of the worst types in Pokemon, and for the champion to specifically terrestrialize her ace into a pure one is just kind of disappointing. Glamora even goes for an Earth Power for some reason instead of a rock move. I might as well stay in. Glamora uses a Terra Blast, which is now a rock type move. And Tatsugiri survives on 6 HP. A single surf gets the one shot, putting an end to Glamora. And the Nuzlocke? No, not really, there's still more. But man, let me just say this now since, like, it's over. That was the most disappointing Elite Four we've had in a long time. The room was boring as hell and we were stuck in there for all four battles. I've already said this. Yeah, it's similar to the last games, but a stadium full of people is so much more interesting to look at than a literal white box. And they were all so weak as well. Don't interrupt Larry Hassel. Like, Geetha's saying all of this, but I feel nothing. I've enjoyed the journey up till now, but the payoff just seems so underwhelming. And Geetha's weaker than Arvin. Arvin. Say what you want about Leon. I personally like him, but I know many people don't. But one thing you can't say is that he didn't have a strong team. His base team's amazing, and the levels are good. Even the Charizard's a threat with its G-Max form and its solid coverage moves. I can say literally nothing about Geetha. I looked up Glamora, and while it's definitely a solid Pokemon, it's not champion ace level. Especially not when it's a pure rock type. And this is the game where they probably have introduced the biggest power creep in Pokemon history. Ignoring a certain sword-wielding dog. There were so many options for her. Avalog and Go-Goat. Goddamn. Even the champion theme was kinda air. They always nailed that part, at least. Okay, it wasn't bad. I think the other stuff is just bringing it down for me. Man, I really wanted Geetha to be good. Sorry to get this rant out now. It was literally all of the thoughts I had in the moment. Like, everyone knows about the game's terrible performance, but that, at least for me, didn't get in the way of my enjoyment. This, however, is the climax of the game, and feels like such a flat way to end it. Especially after the grand open world adventure you had leading up to it, which is much more disappointing in my eyes. Alright, enough of that. It's not over yet. At least even Game Freak knows that Nimona's more interesting than the entire Elite Four combined. Except for you, Larry. Also, let me just get this out of the way now. I completely forgot that King Gambit died, and I may not have remembered that small detail until I started writing the script. So, yeah. The champion battle just left that little of an impression on me. In the center of Mazagoza, we have one final battle with Nimona, and this feels a lot more like a final battle location. All the crowd, including the Elite Four, and our classmates even come to watch this. You know, instead of the champion battle. They even have animation for this part. Amazing. Time for the real champion battle against Nimona. Nimona leads with Lycanroc, and I send out back Scalibur. Don't fill me with hope, Nimona. Okay, the crowd seems to have cleared a bit, and have been replaced by robots. I need to switch out, turn to King Gambit, who, um, is still alive. As Nimona reads my switch, setting up stealth rocks. Level 65! I didn't even see that. 
That makes me unreasonably happy. Thank you, Nimona. Draw room does about half, and an iron head one shots like on rock. Poor Mort's out, and now a nose of fighting type, so it switches to Tinker Tide on the close combat, which still does a lot of damage. I'm unironically so happy. I switch into Skeletor, she takes Rock's damage, expecting another, and then get hit with the double shock, a move I've never seen before. Doing a ton of damage. It says Poor Mort's used up all of its electricity, so maybe it's a move like Burn Up. Well, I can't risk another Mon taking a hit, so I stay in. On the Ice Punch. Maybe she was predicting a switch? Or maybe that move means it can no longer use electric moves? Regardless, we survive and Paul Maud goes down to a single torch song. Nimona brings out Orthworm, which is an interesting choice. And I'm not really sure how fast it is. I stay in. And out speed. Another torch song gets the one shot. With Nimona pseudo legendary Gudra out, there's not much more Skeledurge can do, so I bring back Tinker Ton. On the muddy water, which leaves Tinker Ton on just 9 HP. I don't think I can one-shot, and there's no reason not to expect another, so I switch out to my own pseudo-legendary, and rocks are really starting to hurt now. Our prediction was right, and we take another muddy water. I shouldn't have risked the 10% miss, but we hit Ice School Crash, one-shotting Gudra. Namona has a da-dun sparse. Amazing. It even looks bigger than the one that we saw. I don't know if it makes a difference, but I figure we can stay in. So Baxcalibur hits another Icicle Crash, doing less than half, and we get a flinch. We can now speed finish Dadan Sparse off with the Glaive Rush, and we're on Nimona's final Pokemon, Meow's Karada. This one's actually pretty scary with Flower Trick, which always crits. I decide to make a safe switch into King Gambit as Meow's Karada terrestrializes for a final time into a Grass type. Alright, I was kind of hoping for something else, but whatever. Miascarada hits play rough, doing a fair bit of damage. But I decide to stay in for one more, which King Gambit eats, and hits back with a Kowtow Cleave, doing over half. Another play rough could kill, but we can just use a special move that we prepared. Sucker Punch allows us to outspeed, doing enough damage to put an end to Miascarada. And the Nuzlocke. Except no, it's still not over. We still have a loose blood thread, remember? So, Nimona's definitely one of my favorite rivals now. I love her energy, and I really like the take that she's an established champion that's just kind of doing the victory road path alongside you all over again with a brand new team, while sort of mentoring you. I do wish that she was a bit stronger to back that talk up, and that as we get stronger, she would introduce some of her old team members. Like, we're now going all out against her in a final battle, but she still hasn't used her old team yet, the one that made her a champion. Unless Orthworm and the Dance Pass were supposed to be that, but, eh. Uh, like I said, so many strong options in this generation, but they really limit the important boss battles. Also, another thing is that once again, we have the rival pick the weaker starter. I really want to see this trend go away. But, I was willing to forgive it this time around because A, she's trying to go easy on you, and B, what I, and I'm sure many other people thought, was that because they introduced a new mechanic that allows you to change types, and a new move that gives you a free strong attack of that type, that maybe at some point, she might surprise us by terrestrializing her starter into the type that's strong against our starter. Of course, that never happened, and is such a missed opportunity. Kind of a running theme. But regardless, I still think she's one of the best rivals we've had in terms of character. And that's all of the main storylines wrapped up. But wait, we still haven't had a credit sequence yet. So the Nuzlocke is still technically not over. And that's because there's still one storyline left. The final one. And that is heading into the Great Crater of Paldea. Area Zero. Back to Medelli, home of our favourite Larry, and we can follow the third part that heads up the mountain, eventually leading us to a gated tunnel to an elevator-like construct that looks like it's pulled right out of Made in Abyss. Now for a crater that we're reminded constantly of how dangerous it is. This feels kind of unguarded, like a kid from Medelli could stumble upon this while playing hide and seek. Into the gate, we meet up with Nimona and Penny for some skydiving, and Arvin tries to kill me. Alright, so this is just straight up layer 1 from Made in Abyss. That's not a complaint, the crossover fits so well with Pokemon, especially with the new strange mons that we've been hinted at with Don Fan. And why does the music go so hard? This is like right out of Mystery Dungeon. So this whole next section is a bunch of plot exposition regarding Arvin and Professor Churro. Actually kind of interesting, and it's fun seeing the characters interact with each other while exploring the crater, which I genuinely think looks amazing. I really wish we had more of these sort of locations. 
But I'm not here to explain the story, we're just here for Pokemon battles. So I figure while we go down the abyss, I may as well give my thoughts on the game. But like everyone and the mums already know about all the issues regarding performance, outdated graphics, outdated game design, outdated, okay back on track. So I'll try and stay a bit more positive and just give my general opinions regarding the game design, progression, story beats and so on. Technical issues notwithstanding. And I'll do it as a compliment sandwich. Or lasagna. Or something else that has multiple layers. Because believe it or not, I actually have good things to say about the game as well. Compliment onion. And the first thing I'll say is that I like all of the important characters. Which is rare. I was actually somewhat interested in all of their storylines, and they never felt annoying or too one note, even if they were. And I actually really enjoyed their battles. They weren't the most difficult, but they still felt rewarding. The dialogue between the Mona, Arvin and Penny was also fun to read while going deeper in the crater. But that brings me to my first bad point. Now, I'm a big advocate for the fact that the Pokemon games have always been easy, and people's misconception that the newer games are easier come from the XP share, and or some nostalgia from finding the games difficult when they were kids. Aside from a couple of battles in Emerald, and maybe Claire and Whitney, people grossly exaggerate how hard the earlier generations were. Like that's a rant I'll save you from in this video, but I've got some strong opinions to say the least about that claim. That being said, these games felt a bit too easy. Even while playing this game blind, with level caps, I struggled against exactly one gym, and none of the titans. I may have lost a Pokemon here and there, but a lot of that had to do with me not wanting to be a tryhard on my first playthrough. This game struggles with the same issue that the earlier generations had, where you just need one super effective attack on a decent mon, and you can sweep through the gyms. I thought it was cool that the gym leaders used a mon that one of their type specialties to terrestrialize, but like everything else, there were just so many missed opportunities with this mechanic to make fights interesting. Iono was genuinely the most interesting one, with her terrestrializing her Miss Magius into an electric type with no weaknesses. Just off the top of my head, imagine the grass gym leader having an ace with the flash fire ability. That could have been such a cool subversion, especially if you picked Fue Coco. And she was the third gym leader. Why didn't they take some time to come up with some more interesting strategies like that? Larry's unironically an exception, as Staraptor with a normal boosted facade could hit like a truck. And not cause I'm biased. And the titans were so bad. Like I was overleveled for a couple of them, but even the ones I was underleveled for didn't give me any trouble. Team Star bosses were the only ones that I felt had some consistent, genuine difficulty. Mostly thanks to the Star Mobiles. And I'm being generous. Except Eri, she was actually genuinely tough. Alright, that was a bit long. Let's talk about something else I liked. And that was the Pokemon designs. Maybe controversial, but I thought this region had some great new Pokemon designs that have become some quick favourites of mine. Especially the evolutions of older Pokemon and regional variants. Sure, there are a few bland designs like all gens, but there aren't any ones that I outright hate. Except Spydops. I have a personal vendetta against Spydops for ruining Tarantula. Speaking of which, we run into a few paradox forms here like the Titan Don fan. I can even catch them. I found Iron Juggalus. Juggalus? Juggalus. Which is basically a cyberpunk Hydreigon, and Iron Bundle, which is a good version of Delibird. Kinda wish they thought of more creative names. I'll keep this one short, but another thing I didn't like were the set pieces. Specifically where we had important battles. Like they all kind of just felt like they happened in random locations, and I don't feel like they had any hype to them. Which is kind of a step down from Sword and Shield. Especially the Elite Four, but I've already given my thoughts on why I thought that was bad. I just wish some important battles were done in cooler looking locations. I figure the reason behind this is because the battles are actually done in the open world, like Legends Arceus, but they could have spent more time making these places look better. In a similar vein, with the world now being open, since they didn't know exactly what path we would take, quite a few battles were done in repeated locations, specifically the ones against Nimona. We would typically have to fight in the gym stadium that we were just about to challenge, because they didn't know how to naturally implement her in the open world. So we don't really get any important battles in places like caves, forests, snowy mountaintops or at the end of Victory Road. But despite the quirks regarding that, the decision to go open world was amazing. This is absolutely the direction Pokemon should go in, and riding around on Maridon, I'm bound by invisible walls and people that are dancing for no reason and will disappear for no reason, felt great. You know, technical issues notwithstanding. If we're gonna explore a region, it would make perfect sense for us to go anywhere. Like in Sword and Shield, we literally had a railway. Why couldn't we visit any other towns or cities? Plus, being able to go wherever we wanted just made that adventure feel so much more free. It doesn't feel like we're on rails, destined to go wherever the game needs us to activate progression flags, even if in reality Game Freak still doesn't trust us to make our own decisions. And with that, I will leave my final bad point, and in my opinion, the absolute worst thing about this game. Even more than the technical issues. 
Despite creating an open world that lets us traverse across the whole region with no boundaries, tackle whatever story beats we want in whatever order we want, there is no level scaling whatsoever. Which means despite all this, there is a clear path of progression they want you to follow. And for a Nuzlocke who plays this game based on level progression, there is only ever going to be one path I can go down, which is the same as every other Pokemon game, which makes the previous point kinda moot. And even worse, the intended path makes absolutely no sense. For the player to hit the correct bosses, they will need to go in a zigzag all throughout the region. As I've already outlined with the first few boss battles leading up to the fourth gym, you need to head through the west exit of Mezagoza, which makes sense as that's where Nomona tells you to go. Then you need to backtrack through the east exit to do the first titan and the second gym, and then back to the west exit to do the second titan and the first team star base, and then back through the east exit to do the third gym, then back ever so slightly to do the second team star base, then finally go past the third gym to do the third titan, and then go all the way back to the west exit, back to where the first team Starbase was to do the fourth gem. There is absolutely no way a player will follow this naturally. What's gonna happen is that they'll follow one path, steamroll the first boss, maybe struggle with the second and third bosses, level up to handle them, maybe decide to take the other route, and then find themselves in a position where they've just made the next four bosses into absolute jokes by being over leveled like crazy. Which wouldn't make sense from their perspective as they just followed the path. Literally all they needed to do was scale the boss battles. While preferred, they don't have to scale the wild Pokemon and trainers, the bosses would have been enough. And the absolute worst part about all this that makes me upset is that they've already done the hard part, actually accounting for if you do things out of the intended order. All they needed to do was create a few different teams for each boss, which gets selected depending on how far in that particular storyline you are. Like, they don't have to be complicated picks. This is Game Freak. It's not like they create competitively thought out teams for each bosses anyway. Just have a pool of four Pokemon that they pick from depending on what stage you're at, and scale their levels accordingly. That's it. Usually people who defend lazy decisions like to use the argument that we're not game developers so what do we know? But you don't need my 6 years in software development to know that these are essentially just a bunch of if statements paired with a library that stores team data. Like there were tons of easy solutions. Hell, there is an entire ROM hack built in Gen 2's engine that does exactly that. This is like one of the least ambitious things to accomplish. Doing this should be one of the easiest things they can implement, and yet they still didn't. That upsets me more than any frame rate drops, graphical bugs, or outdated textures. Wow, that became a lot longer than I had intended. But hey, at least you had plenty of time to see the story in action, reading the text boxes yourself while I went on my rant. Right? Didn't I say something about wanting to stay more positive? Well, we finally made it to the depths of the abyss, and we had a glimpse of what injured Miraidon in the first place when we met him. Another Miraidon. Nomona absolutely can't read a room, and we need to find a horde of Paradox Mons to enter the lab where Shuro resides. This is pretty straightforward, but it gives us a good excuse to ditch our friends while we meet with the Giga Chad himself. Here we learn that Shuro, the one that we've been talking to all this time, is actually an AI, with the real one having been killed in an accident. Nuzlocke's really get intense sometimes. And the reason why the AI brought us down here was to shut down the machine, bringing back Paradox Pokemon over to our world. Something which would destroy the current ecosystem as it is, and something that the original Churo was completely fine with. So yeah. Arvin's dad was kind of an asshole. Even the AI, based on his personality, realized that this was stupid. But of course it doesn't go down that simply. After using the ID to initiate the shutdown protocol, AI Churo is now overridden and is now back to his initial state with Churo's thoughts, wanting to put a stop to us. This whole sequence is so hammy and so stupid and I am absolutely here for it. This actually felt so hype at the time, seeing the machine whir up behind Churo with a master ball dropping from the sky. This is what a final battle should be and not that lame ass Pokemon League. Take notes Geetha, this is the actual final battle. Alturo leads with Iron Moth, which is clearly a futuristic Volcarona, and I lead with Bexcalibur. I have zero clue what the typing is. We know that despite their names and metallic sheen, they aren't all steel types, so this could be anything. I stay in as it outspeeds to hit Sludge Wave, so it's probably a poison type. Ow, we have Sludge Wave in the present as well. When in doubt, Glaive Rush. And that does indeed get us the one shot. Next is Iron Thorns, who is a Tyranitar. I actually wasn't expecting that. I'm pretty convinced that these things don't have the same base stats as their present counterparts, but I still feel the need to switch out. Bax will take double damage this turn anyway. But into what? 
I have no clue what types they are, and he could go for any move. Maybe it's still a rock type since Bax is an ice type? I bring out Tinker Tun on the stone edge. It doesn't do much damage, so I figure the safest thing to do is lock thorns with Encore. We can survive another stone edge, but even with the crit, I'm not sure if the wind button kills from here. Like if it has a secondary type that resists steals, and iron thorns could be steel, then Tinker Tun's useless for the rest of the fight. We know a stone edge is coming, so switching out to King Gambit is the safest course of action. Thorns outspeeds to his final one before being freed, which also crits, and King Gambit hits a super effective low kick doing a lot. Probably not four times effective though. And we can just outspeed the next turn with Sucker Punch to finish Iron Thorns off. Next is Iron Hands, who we've already seen before, so into Skeledurge and the Drain Punch, who can then use Earth Powers to two shot the hands. Not Hard Dragon's up next, and I've caught one of these, so I know it's a Dark Flying type. I know a Dark Move's coming, so back into King Gambit. Now I'm pretty sure this thing has coverage. It won't be using a dark or flying move, but might have flamethrower or earth power. So into Tatsugiri on the flamethrower. Best case scenario. Juggalus does manage to outspeed doing a lot with Dark Pulse, and unfortunately Surf doesn't quite match the power. But this does give me an idea. Into Tinker Tunnel on the next Dark Pulse. And now I can switch back into Backscalibur on the flamethrower, increasing her attack thanks to the ability. Now we can outspeed with a super effective ice shard to pick up the kill. I honestly don't know if that crit mattered. Shuro understands the pain of being a Nuzlocker. Next is Iron Bundle, another familiar face, but considering it's a water ice type, we don't really have much we can switch into. But there is something that we can do. Switching into our Bolivar, we take a strong freeze dry that does a lot, but also sets up grassy terrain, restoring some HP back. Now another freeze dry will kill, but what we can do is terrestrialize into a normal type, removing that weakness, as Iron Bundle goes for Snowscape. Cool. A boosted terrain pulse gets the one shot. And finally we're up against Iron Valiant who actually looks awesome. Something feels so nostalgic about this for some reason. Like Metal Sonic. And it even uses an item, Booster Energy, that raises its attack for some reason. This is clearly the ace. Issue is however, I don't even know where to begin with this type. It's clearly a God of War Gallade robot hybrid, so maybe a psychic type. And it also looks like a fighting type, but that's just Gallade. Well, I'm betting it has a fighting type attack at least, so into Skeledurge on the Brick Break. Next we get hit with a Psycho Cut, which of course crits at the worst moment, and we use a Torch Song. That also crits, leaving Valiant barely alive. This could be bad. I stay in. Valiant goes for another Psycho Cut, and Skeledurge lives on 12 HP. The terrain mattered, and a final Torch Song puts an end to Iron Valiant. And the Nuzlocke. For real this time. Now this is a final battle. This is what the other final battles should be like. Trainers using clearly busted Pokemon. Like I took a look at the Paradox Pokemon stats. And they all have stats with a base total of 570. That's as strong as Ultra Beasts. And Churro has 5 of them. Oh, and the sixth one, Iron Valiant, has a base stat total of 590. Pretty much a pseudo legendary. And all of their stats are almost min-maxed like Ultra Beasts. Depending on your matchup, this could go really bad. All the better. Well, there is actually another final battle with our Miraidon finally gaining the confidence to face up to the other Miraidon that was apparently competing for territory with, but this is a battle that we're programmed to win, so we don't really care about that. Alturo reveals to Arvin that his parents are dead, refuses to elaborate, leaves. Truly a Giga Chad. Why did they make Arvin's story so tragic? Like I genuinely feel so bad for him. But they did make his character a lot more interesting than I initially thought when we first met him, so cheer up Arvin. The death of your parent wasn't meaningless, it made you interesting. I'm not good at pep talks. Penny was also really cool, and I'm glad that she was actually strong in terms of story, and not just some meek kid that lets everyone walk all over her and somehow ended up in power. Finally, Namona is one of my favourite rivals. I like her whole battle trigger happy attitude and that she's more of a mentor for you throughout the story, waiting for you to get strong enough to fight her head on, without that ever feeling too annoying, at least in my opinion. I wish she was a bit stronger in-game, but in terms of character, I think she's great. And that's the game. Good lord, why is this video so long? To finish up my compliment sandwich, lasagna, ogre, despite all of its flaws, I still had tons of fun playing through this game and see a ton of potential for replayability and challenge runs. 
I truly do think that deep within the technological mess that this game is, there is a great game hidden underneath waiting to be realized. But likely not while it's still being developed by Game Freak. Look, the thing is, if I want difficulty, I can and will play ROM hacks. We shouldn't have to rely on them, but that's just the way it is. I still managed to find tons of enjoyment playing this game and have tons of ideas moving forward with it. And that's all that really matters to me personally. But I promise those videos won't be this long, don't you worry. So please look forward to them in the future.